Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Please take your seats. Wonderful. Welcome, everyone, to tonight's uh, West Hollywood City Council meeting. Um, first, we're going to do the land acknowledgement, and I'm really happy. Mikey Friedman, please come on up and do it. The West Hollywood City Council acknowledges that the land on which we gather and that is currently known as the City of West Hollywood is the occupied, unceded, seized territory of the Gabrieleño Tongva and the Gabrieleño Keech peoples. Thank you so much, Mikey. I am now going to call this meeting to order. It is 6 o'clock, and I'm really excited. Well, Pena Ziering, come up and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. You can come right there. Yep, we can go right to that mic. Oh no, Pena, go to that one. Oh. Yeah, you get the spotlight. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much, Penna. City Clerk, may we have a roll call? Yes, Mayor. Council Member Hadden? Here. Council Member Here. Council Member Shine? Present. Vice Mayor Byers? Here. And Mayor Erickson? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you so much. Um, City Attorney, may we please have a report out of the closed session agenda? Yes, thank you. Good evening. The City Council convened a closed session around 535 this evening. There were no members of the public to speak on the closed session agenda. The Council discussed the one item of business on the posted agenda, a matter of anticipated litigation under Government Code Section 54956.9D2 and E3 and took no reportable action. The closed session concluded at 550 p.m. That concludes my report. Thank you so much. We're going to now move on to approval of the, gen the agenda. Um, Madam City Clerk, are there any changes from staff? No changes. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go to my colleagues. Do anyone have some changes? Councilmember Heilman. I'm wondering if we can move 6D, 6E, and 6F to consent. 6D, 6E, and 6F. I'm fine with those. Should I continue? Uh, yes, please continue. Oh, I, I had two more. Oh, okay. Oh. Keep it going. Uh, I, well, one more. I was wondering uh, if we could combine 3B and 3C as a public hearing. They both involve the extension of permits. I'm, I'm fine with that. Is that okay, Madam City Clerk? Sounds good. We'll take those together. Councilmember Meister. Thank you. Um, I'd like to see if we can move 6A. Uh, 6B and 6C to consent? Uh, I have um, uh, questions about 6B. Sounds good. Okay. 6A and 6C, though? Sounds good. And okay. uh, also, I'd like to pull 2G, addressing the resiliency of WeHo as it relates to nature based events. Sounds I have, good. I have some comments. Thank you. Sounds good. All right, seeing no other items, we are adding Aye. to consent 6A. It's the agreement with PALP Incorporated, uh, 6C, the Pride House event exploration, 6D, the Women's uh, uh, Visibility Week, 6E, Equality Fashion Week, 6F, the American Born Chinese event. Um, we are combining items 3B and 3C, and we are pulling item 2G. Uh, Mayor, just I have a disclosure I need to make. Um, I received a contribution, uh, contributions of $250 or more for my congressional race uh, from Nick Casey and Bonnie Hyde, so I am disclosing this and recusing myself under the Levine Act from items 6E and 6F. 6E. Thank you so much, Councilmember Shine. And uh, City Attorney Lang, you're, thank you so much. All right, we're all on the same page here. All right, may I get a motion and a second to approve the agenda? The motion button isn't coming up. We might do it the old-fashioned way tonight. I'll move to approve. Second. <laughs> Sounds good. We have a motion by Councilmember Heilman and a second by Vice Mayor Byers. Uh, why don't we do a voice vote, Madam City Clerk? Yes. Councilmember Heilman. Aye. Councilmember Meister. Aye. Councilmember Shine. 
I am noting my disclosure again. Thank you. Vice Mayor Byers. Aye. And Mayor Eriks. Aye. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you so much, colleagues. Um, do we have any adjournment motions this evening? I'm going to start to my left. Councilmember Heilman. Um, um, Councilmember Meister is going to start the adjournment. Okay, sounds good. Councilmember Meister. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, I'd like to adjourn in memory of David Mixner. Civil rights and peace activist David Mixner died at his adopted home of New York City on Monday, March 11th at the age of 77. David was a longtime resident of Huntley Drive in West Hollywood, and prior to that, David lived north of Santa Monica Boulevard on Hilldale. David's activism started in his teen years when he volunteered for the John F. Kennedy presidential campaign and spanned through the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War era, and the threat of nuclear war. David successfully lobbied former Governor Ronald Reagan to oppose the Briggs Initiative, which would have denied employment opportunities to the LGBTQ teachers in California. The initiative was soundly defeated when at David's urging, Reagan penned an op-ed opposing the initiative. David continued to fight for equal equality in the battle against HIV AIDS for the, for the right to serve openly in the military and for marriage equality. David was also a champion of LGBTQ candidates for public office, having co-founded the Victory Fund in 1991. David was famously arrested multiple times, including twice in front of the White House, suffered beatings and broken bones, but remained resolute and steadfast in his commitment to making the world a better place. David relocated to the East Coast and spent the balance of his life there and leaves behind many friends and fellow advocates in West Hollywood and in the entire Southern California region and indeed throughout the country. Thank you. And I ask to join uh, Council Member Meister in this adjournment because I think we both knew uh, David the best of the council. He made a, just incredible an indelible impact throughout his commitment to justice, equality. Uh, he fought uh, relentlessly against discrimination and bigotry, uh, striving to create an inclusive society for all. Um, he had passion, he had leadership, um, he was tenacious, he fought for progress and positive change, not only for today, but for generations to come. Not only was he an activist in terms of LGBT issues and AIDS-related issues, he was a peace advocate. He uh, helped initiate the Walk Across America for Peace. As we reflect on David's incredible contributions, let us all take a moment to express our gratitude for his tireless and unwavering advocacy. I hope his legacy will continue to inspire all of us and future generations to stand up for what is right and what is just. Thank you so much, Councilmember Meister and Councilmember Heilman. He was a very lovely man and we will miss him dearly. Um, Councilmember Schein, do you have any adjournment motions? No. Nope. Thank you. Con Vice Mayor Byers. And I, mine was David as well, and I'm, the tribute this done did his memory justice. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to move on to presentations. Um, and first, we're going to bring back up Penna, if you want to come up, and we're going to take a photo with you in this certificate, which gets you out of your math homework. Next up, we're going to go over to Councilmember Heilman, who has a proclamation of recognition of Eugene Alper. Thank you, Mayor. It's, um, it's a bittersweet uh, opportunity to present a proclamation to Eugene Alper. 
Eugene was hired in uh, the city in 1995, and he's worked continuously for West Hollywood since that time. He was actually the city's first Russian outreach worker in the public safety division. He was later promoted to code enforcement officer and then promoted to senior code enforcement officer in rent stabilization. And later, he was promoted once again to code enforcement supervisor in the neighborhood and business uh, uh, safety division in January 2023. And uh, I think this is out of the proclamation, but people don't realize that during that time, he also found the time to go back to school and get a graduate degree. Um, his contributions to the community are numerous. Um, he led the first residential code enforcement or code compliance team in 1999. He implemented the first proactive multifamily inspection program in 2024. Uh, he has taught numerous code enforcement officers, not only in the city of West Hollywood, but in other communities uh, as well. Eugene is known for his dedication, his strong work ethic, his compassion, and his completely uncompromising personal and professional integrity. Uh, his dedication to public service has been great. His commitment to the city's core values um, has been great as well. He is going to be sorely missed at the city of West Hollywood by the community, by the city leaders, and his peers. Um, we will be forever grateful for his mentorship and his commitment to the city. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the city of West Hollywood recognizes Eugene Alpert for his outstanding legacy of 29 years of service, and we wish him well in his new position. Eugene, are you here? There he is. Thank you. Dear uh, Mayor Erickson, Council Members, Schein, Meister, Heilman, and Byers, thank you so much for this uh, warm goodbye. I hope it's not going to be goodbye, but hopefully just so long, because when you work in one place for so long, you become, it becomes a big chunk of your life, and you can't just walk away from this. I'm going to the city of San Mateo, but I don't think I'm leaving. I'm taking West Hollywood with me. Uh, for, uh, I've been fortunate and pre um, privileged to work for the city for almost 20, uh, 30 years. Um, the city has given me um, some of the most difficult cases on which I learned a lot. Uh, I've made a lot of mistakes, but I hopefully I learned something. The city has also given me some of the most delicate and politically sensitive cases, mm -hmm. and I have also learned on them. I had to dig deep inside of my soul and find uh, things that I didn't know existed there. For example, a lot of patience, and as uh, my boss Vito says, humanistic approach to people. I have found it, and hopefully I've learned from that, that as well. But also, aside from professional life, I also, this city and this council has been by my side in some of the most pivotal moments of my life. When, um, when I became a citizen of the United States, Fred Solomon, uh, your deputy, organized a presentation for me and, and celebration, and she bought a delicious chocolate cake. Uh, I don't know, I don't remember all the faces that were there, but I certainly remember that cake. Uh, <laughs> and also, uh, when my daughter became a valedictorian, this council recognized her and gave her a proclamation similar to this. And when my mom passed away, this city council adjourned in her memory. So when you have this life, uh, personal and professional, intermingled, uh, you cannot just walk away. So again, thank you so much for your uh, attention to me, and thank you so much for having me for almost 30 years. Thank you so much, Eugene.
And Eugene, anytime I miss you, I'm just gonna go watch Veep and see you make me laugh more than you probably should. El Eugene is also a very accomplished actor who starred in some of the most prolific shows out there and he is freaking funny. That's all I gotta tell you. So we will miss you, Eugene. Um, next, I would like to um, recognize uh, Vice Mayor Byers who has a recognition of the National Condom Day exhibition. That's right, thank you so much, Mayor. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the remarkable exhibitions that were showcased recently at the Circus of Books here in West Hollywood. This work celebrated National Condom Day, which takes place every February 13th. This showcase at the Circus of Books was organized as part of an initiative to raise awareness and advocate for safe sexual practices in partnership with the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. Tonight, I'm thrilled to have the artists here with us who contributed to this initiative by creating condom art exhibits, as well as, um, well, I know Circus of Books couldn't be with us, but a representative from our Arts Commission who will represent them well tonight. And on that note, I want to extend a special shout out to our Arts and Cultural Affairs Commissioner, Mito Avilas, who did tremendous work in coordinating the bureaucracy of LA County Department of Public Health and wrangling the artists and finding a venue here in West Hollywood, which was the obvious perfect home for such an exhibit. So thank you so much for that. Um, this exhibit was just brilliant. If you didn't get a chance to see it, I know it's still circulating digitally on social media. And so it is my honor to invite the following individuals to the dais to accept certificates and take a group photo with myself and my colleagues. Paige Person, Gunnar Dethridge, Ali Spagnola, Chad Michael, Christian Morissette, and Mito Avilas, please come join us on behalf of Circus of Books. Yes, round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, um, council members, mayor, vice mayor, for this acknowledgement. I want to go ahead and say uh, my name is Mito Aviles, and I'm the chair of the Arts and Cultural Affairs Commission for the city of West Hollywood. And I'm proud to lead an amazing commission that effectively brings creativity, art, and culture into the city. As chair of the commission, my goal is to bring free and accessible art to not only our residents, but the people that visit our great city. Since I have been in the, on the commission, we have, been, we have made great strides to bring world-class programming through our Summer Sounds program, through our Winter Sounds, through our speaker series, through poetry, to art uh, in public, and our legendary grants programming. Uh, a world-class city deserves world-class art. This is why this is my top priority. I'd like to thank my cohort of commissioners and my arts team for seeing the vision. Continue, and also, let us not forget to continue to fund arts programming. So thank you very much to the artists, to Circus of Books, who can't here, be here today, but um, Paige, Ali, Chad Michael, Gunnar, thank you so much, so thank you. Thank you so much for saying yes to my outrageous concept. It was thrilling to be a part of this. As a resident of the city for 25 years, as an artist, the creative city, I really do feel like I get to be myself here. And so this is lovely, thank you. Uh, 
I just want to say thank you for uh, funding a really cool program like this. I'm a fashion designer, uh, and it can seem like a very vapid industry at points. And so when there's a chance to uh, give it a little bit of meaning and like really raise awareness, it's a really cool thing. So I appreciate the opportunity to do this. Thank you, West Hollywood, for your commitment to spreading awareness about HIV and ending the stigma. As a member of the trans community, this is an issue that many of my siblings face, and I really appreciate the commitment that you have to spreading awareness. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Congratulations again to everyone. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Shine, who has a recognition of No Ruth. Thank you, Mayor. So tomorrow is the spring equinox, as well as uh, Noruz and Persian New Year. Um, so I am uh, going to read our proclamation in recognition of Noruz. Uh, whereas for millions of people around the world, Noruz marks a new year and the beginning of spring Observed for more than 3,000 years on the vernal equinox, Noruz translates into New Day in Farsi and is the name of the Persian New Year. And March 19th is the start of the celebration of Noruz in 2024. Noruz is celebrated by more than 300 million people around the world and is a day of celebration enjoyed by people of different faiths. One of the few celebrations of an ancient Persian culture that is not restricted to a specific religious group. Noruz celebrates the renewal of nature and brings family and friends together to take part in unique traditions, welcoming the arrival of spring. Central to the celebration is setting the haft scene table with an arrangement of seven symbolic items that start with the letter S. Somag, which is sumak berries, sanjed, dried lotus tree fruit, Serke, which is vinegar, seeb apples, samanu sweet pudding, sabze sprouts, and sear garlic. We also have uh, mare uh, fish traditionally, uh, eggs, and um, candles, as well as whatever um, book uh, Iranians and Persians choose to have at our tables. Um, the Los Angeles region is home to the largest Iranian community outside of Iran, enriching the diverse tapestry of cultures that are foundational to West Hollywood and beyond. The city of West Hollywood wishes all Iranian communities a happy Nowruz. Madame um, Mohammad Gamke, Nowruz Mubarak, Vaga Mubarak, Mehameh Ham Matana. And the city is grateful for its partnerships with the various Iranian organizations, including the Iranian American Women Foundation, who has partnered with the city to bring programming to celebrate Nowruz, as well as bring awareness to issues impacting the Iranian community and um, the Women, Life, Freedom Revolution. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of West Hollywood hereby recognizes March 19th, 2024 as Nowruz Day in West Hollywood and wishes all Iranian communities throughout West Hollywood and beyond a happy Nowruz. And um, please, uh, as you walk outside, you'll see that the city uh, staff has put a half scene um, in the uh, uh, council chambers outside area in the lobby. And so it's a reminder of the diverse, diversity and richness of cultures within our community and um, wishing everyone a joyful, prosperous new year. Please, uh, my colleagues, join me and the women from the Iranian American Women's Foundation. Uh, for accepting this proclamation. Thank you.
Good evening. My name is Shireen Madian, and on behalf of the Iranian American Women's Foundation, I would like to thank Council Member Shine and the entire esteemed West Hollywood City Council for this honorable distinction and for your continued support of Persian causes and our culture. Um, Council Member Shine, you already touched on a lot of my points, so I apologize if this sounds repetitive, but Nowruz is my favorite holiday. It is the Persian New Year, and it's an ancient holiday that's been celebrated for at least 3,000 years, and it predates all modern religions. Nowruz is celebrated by people of many religions and ethnicities all along the ancient Silk Roads, and of course, here in Southern California, which boasts the largest Persian diaspora in the world. Nowruz, as Councilmember Shine said, literally translates to new day, and it ushers in the exact moment of spring and the beginning of a 13-day long celebration. Families like mine immigrated to the US for freedom and a better life, but we always maintained our cherished Nowruz traditions, lighting fires in our backyards to jump over, symbolizing purification and creating the sofra half scene, like the beautiful half scene that's in the lobby here, containing the symbols of Nowruz, symbols of rebirth and renewal, wealth and fertility, beauty, medicine, the sunrise, wisdom, age, patience, love, reflection, and light. These representations of nature and rebirth connect us all universally. So tomorrow night at 8.06 p.m., I hope that the spirit of Nowruz will be with all of us as we are surrounded by family, poetry, delicious food to celebrate the start of spring, and that this new year will mark a new age of freedom for our sisters in Iran who have been so tirelessly fighting for it. I wish you all a very happy Noruz, Noruz Etun Piruz Basha. Thank you so much. All right. <clears throat> and I get to do our last uh, couple proclamations here. And thank you to the members of the public. We jammed in a lot today because we got a lot to celebrate. And we need a little bit more joy in this world if you get what I'm saying. Um, it is Women's History Month, as we know, um, and I'm really excited to uh, give a proclamation in recognition of Violet Palmer. And when I tell you how amazing this individual is, you're gonna see why in a second here. So Violet Palmer broke gender barriers by becoming the first female referee in a major professional sport the National Basketball Association. For nearly two decades as an NBA official, Violet officiated 930, 930 regular season games, nine playoff games, and the 2014 All-Star Game. And whereas in 2009, while officiating in the NBA, she set her eyes on the collegiate level and soon became the coordinator of the women's basketball officials for the West Coast Conference. Her impressive leadership skills attracted the attention of collegiate commissioners, and she became a coordinator for the Pac-12 Conference, the Western Athletic Conference, Big Sky, and the Big West. And, and whereas Violet retired from active officiating in 2016 after a stellar career and earning the respect of her peers, she continues to consult for the NBA and train new referees. And whereas Violet's imprint on basketball will be felt for generations to come as a collegiate player and as a referee and official, she left an incredible mark at Cal Poly Pomona from 1982 to 1986 and helped build the Broncos into an NCAA Division II powerhouse. As a starting point guard, she led the Broncos to back-to-back -to -back national championships, 1985 and 1986, three regional titles, and four CCA regular season championships. She finished her career in the top 10 all-time in steals, and the Broncos went 107 and 20 and 45 and two CCA in her four seasons. And whereas Violet Palmer has ensured her name will stand in basketball record books. And we are grateful for her, the opportunity to recognize her contributions as part of Women's History Month. Her groundbreaking achievements paved the way for other women in the field of sports officiating. During her career, Violet has received numerous recognitions and awards, including the Naismith Award for her Official of the Year in 1999, the Gold Whistle Award presented by the NBA, National Association of Sports Officials, and she was inducted into the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame. Now, therefore, let it be resolved that the City Council of the City of West Hollywood hereby recognizes this badass individual, Violet Palmer, for her groundbreaking achievements in the sports of basketball, the sports officiating, and declares today, March 18th, 2024, as Violet Palmer Day in the City of West Hollywood. Please come up, Violet.
Wow, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, I should say. Uh, to Mayor Erickson, thank you so much. To the City Council, I am so honored. Um, you know, after reading all that, I have to sometimes think, oh my God, I pinch myself. He's talking about me. Uh, I'm honored. Uh, I love West Hollywood. Um, I've been born and raised right here, and I'm, I'm so fortunate. And I just have to give a special thanks to my good friend, uh, Todd Hosman. He actually advocated for me. And I have my wife, obviously, for, uh, for She's been with me for 29 years, and she's put up with a lot of basketball. And I just want to thank her. I have my good friends also um, here to support me. But what an honor, and what a perfect month to receive this award, it being when the National Women's Month. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. I love West Hollywood, and thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we love you. All right, last but certainly not least, I'm really, I'm really honored that our Transgender Advisory Board is here today to accept a proclamation for Transgender Day of Visibility. Whereas the city of West Hollywood has historically been a proud supporter of the transgender community and has been on the forefront of transgender rights by developing a transgender advisory board and a transgender memorial to honor victims of transgender hate crimes. And whereas transgender and gender nonconforming youth are increasingly targeted by anti-LGBTQ legislation and policies, or I just call them bigots, the city unequivocally supports the transgender and gender non-conforming community's struggle for full equality and protection, including their health and happiness. In April 2023, the city adopted a resolution declaring West Hollywood as a sanctuary city for transgender people, and annually, on March 31st, the city of West Hollywood joins in worldwide observation of Transgender Day of Visibility. And whereas this year, the West Hollywood, City of West Hollywood and the Transgender Advisory Board will celebrate Transgender Day of Visibility by lighting City Hall and the City Lanterns over Santa Monica Boulevard in the colors of the transgender flag, as well as fly the transgender flag on city flagpoles during March 31st, 2024 through April 7th. And whereas Transgender Day of Visibility celebrates the vibrancy unity and pride of the transgender community and as an opportunity to find ways to build greater equality and social acceptance from the local to international levels. Now therefore let it be resolved that the City Council of the City of West Hollywood hereby proclaims March 31st, 2024 as Transgender Day of Visibility in West Hollywood. And now I'd like to invite our members of our tab up here to take a photo with all of us. Good evening, Mayor Erickson and City Council members of the City of West Hollywood. I'm Karina Samala, Chair of the West Hollywood Transgender Advisory Board. First, I would like to thank each one of you for your efforts to bring visibility to the transgender community through collaboration with TAC, with APIT, St. John's, and Community Health Services. Many thanks to the entire City Council for exceptional leadership for, and for keeping your eyes in, on our community. I also like to thank each member of the Transgender Advisory Board that are here tonight and their commitment to the dedication and in advising the policies and addressing housing, healthcare, workforce development, and equity for our community. Today, we're here for the, our goals of keeping the city's transgender community visible and safe. 
Transgender Awareness Month is a time for transgender people and their supporters to assist in educating the public what transgender individuals face on a day-to-day -day basis, prejudice, discrimination, and violence. Here in West Hollywood and LA, we have city officials who are fully supportive of our community and assist us in making sure that human and civil rights of all its citizens are protected. We continue to work diligently with LAPD and the Sheriff's Department. And with their continued support, we hope to ensure that violence towards transgender community is taken seriously and there is an immediate response to all hate crimes. While there is much work to be done, we are determined to work together for the betterment of the city and our community. The work created by the Los Angeles Housing and Community Investment and the Transgender Advisory Council is worth taking granted. Thank you for all this wonderful council presentation celebrating our Transgender Awareness Month. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thanks, Mara. Wonderful. Do you want to say something real quick? Yes, please. Gotcha. Hi, everyone. Oh, don't worry. I'll be easy tonight. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for this beautiful recognition for Transgender Day of Visibility because our visibility in the city of West Hollywood is so, so crucial and it is so, so important. Thank you so much for standing with us. Thank you so much for fighting with us. You know, I always like to say I can be a little problematic, but I'm problematic with a purpose. I'm problematic for justice. I'm problematic for equality. And I'm problematic for the liberation that all of our liberation is tied. And I just want to say thank you all so much and continue to fight for us because you sit in a place where we right now are not sitting at, but we will be there one day. And when we are there, we will shine. We will glow. And oh my gosh, so much. We just want to say thank you, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Problematic with a purpose. That sounds like a great t-shirt blossom, if I may say so myself. Sounds like a fundraiser. All right, before I get myself into trouble, the city council values your comments. We're going to move on to public comment. Uh, however, pursuant to the Brown Act, the city council cannot take action on items listed not on the posted agenda. The public comment is period is limited to 20 minutes with two minutes allotted for each speaker. The public comment period is to address the city council on consent calendar items or of items of general interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council. Another period is also reserved for the con general comment later in the meeting and for those that could not be heard at this time. Public hearing testimony will only be taken at the time of the public hearing. If you go over your two minutes and do not respond to the city clerk's notification that your time has expired, your microphone will be muted. If you signed up to speak on both consent calendar items and the general co public comment, as well as an item that was moved to consent calendar, you may take this public comment period to speak on the consent calendar items. You may also sign up to speak during the second public comment period for your general public comment. Lastly, speakers should not bring any items to the podium other than the prepared written statement and or writing materials. Madam City Clerk, how many speakers do we have today? We have a total of nine speakers in chambers. And one in Zoom for general public comment. Great, we're gonna actually go to the ones in chambers because I believe those are on consent calendar items. There are a few, yes, there Great. are three. And then we'll go to general and we'll have Zoom at the end. Great. Go ahead. Um, all right, so we have Rick Watts to be followed by Mikey Friedman. Thank you, Mayor, Council, uh, Rick Watts, City of West Hollywood. Um, what, I'm uh, speaking on a consent calendar item, which I typically would not do, but in this case, uh, it is with regard to the, uh, the matters of the, uh, uh, the Disabilities Advisory Board and Senior Advisory Board. And I, and, uh, I want to note that uh, this, this past weekend, uh, the uh, um, Downtown was the uh, um, the Abilities Expo, which uh, which seeks to uh, to enable inclusion of persons with disabilities, which includes also an awful lot of seniors, disproportionately so, uh, in full participation in society, in government, in in commerce, and in life in general. Uh, when 
our Constitution was drafted back in 1787 and then ratified. Uh, it started with the words, we the people. And uh, while it, we have fallen short in, in, uh, in holding ourselves to that promise over the decades, uh, it is something that we aspire to do. And uh, persons with disabilities uh, are part of that we the people. Um, the, uh, I, I, I want to again raise the matter of the, uh, uh, the bill uh, uh, AB 2449 as regards uh, persons being able to participate via uh, uh, Zoom or other electronic means in, in meetings. That was intended by the state legislature to enlarge that participation. And there are members of both of those boards and occasionally of other boards and commissions that uh, need that to be followed. Um, that was not a suggestion to bodies such as a city council. That was a mandate. And, uh, uh, and I just wish that that uh, would be followed. Thank you. Thank you so much. And maybe the city attorney can give us an understanding of that law better and how it applies. Mikey Friedman uh, to be followed by James Bryan. Mikey Friedman, West Hollywood. Byrd let the city blindly go ahead with phase two and didn't say a word about going into bankruptcy and you trusted them. And I don't get why you still trust Lyme. All along they've refused to cooperate. Are they gonna change now and start monitoring the scooter riders, paying the penalties and picking up the abandoned scooters? Have you checked their uh, record in other cities? Will Lyme swoop in with their own scooters to replace the ones that Bird has removed? The contract says they can only have 200 scooters, but will they dump more here without permission again? I worry about our pedestrians tripping over and being hit by scooters. And we continue to spend our tax money on block by block and ABM to do Lyme's job. Now, the new clause, Lyme must give you advance notice if they're going into bankruptcy. Listen up, here's some important considerations for you. No matter what they tell you, Lyme won't release that information ahead of time because that would send their venture capitalists scrambling to recoup their investment money before it's gone. Lyme CEO says they're profitable, but he has never released independent verification of that. The CEO also says they rely on RFPs, so they have to charm cities in order to get their scooters in. Lime has private stock, which is selling at four cents a share, but they're having trouble qualifying for the IPO they really want to go public. And news of a bankruptcy would endanger their chances of getting an underwriter for that IPO. Please, don't sign anything. Find out their true financial health from independent sources. I saw that you asked for statistics on accidents. But safety is more than just the number of accidents. You have to trust the people you're working with. Do you? So for your safety and ours, dump the scooters and the contract too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mikey. Um, James Bryan to be followed by David Nash. Thank you, Mayor and Council. My name is James Bryan, a researcher with Unite Here Local 11, the Hotel Workers Union. I'm here to speak on consent calendar item 6B, or at least formerly was new business item 6B, now Six, moved to consent calendar. 6B was a move to consent. Do you want to speak on it during the item? Uh, I would like to speak on it during the item. Sure. Yes, thank you. Okay, we'll see you in a little bit. Um, David Nash to come on up to be followed by Scott Schmidt. Thank you, David Nash, West Hollywood. I'd like to speak on something that we're all kind of aware of but don't talk about enough. Size really matters. You're a big man, Mr. Mayor. I'm sure you understand that. I want to talk about it in two specific areas. One is the size of our affordable housing units. Although I spoke of in favor of the new project that was approved recently, and I celebrated at a, a meeting at Rocco's earlier this, earlier this evening. I don't approve of 300 square foot apartments. I know the whole world is going smaller to house more people, but I would be so proud to stand up and say, not in West Hollywood, 
We stop at 500 feet, nothing smaller. It, it just, 500 square feet is a reasonable place to live. 300 square feet or less is getting really tight. Another place that size matters to me is in the booklet you put out for um, the uh, social services and for the city ordinances about rent stabilization. They are these little half-size booklets about this big with very small print, bad graphics, bad color combinations. I can't believe we spend millions of dollars on social services and then have this low-end little pamphlet put out that's not user-friendly. I just think we could do a full-size magazine with color pictures and proudly present our social services to the people that need information about it. Lastly, I'd like to talk about lighting. When we have a panel on the floor, they're poorly lit from the front and overlit in the back. I can't believe we can not do better lighting here. The back is overlit, the front is underlit. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Scott Schmidt to be followed by Mark Baer. Good evening, Mayor Erickson, uh, members of the City Council, Scott Schmidt, resident of West Hollywood. I first want to start by thanking you, Mayor, Councilmember Heilman, Councilmember Meister, uh, for your words about David Mixner earlier. A uh, very important figure in our community, and you know, as folks like us get older, it's important that we remember all of the struggles of our past so that we can learn from them and pass them on to future generations. Um, item 6C, it's on consent. Uh, looking at doing a pride house here in West Hollywood during the Olympics, amazing idea. Love it. We should think about that during the World Cup, and also perhaps think about putting together a community task force of businesses, residents, creative people to think about how we can leverage the Olympics coming to Los Angeles for West Hollywood specifically, perhaps partnering with LA SEC, other groups. We know that the city of LA is gonna try and get as much as possible. So let's try and get our share of that, that while it's coming. Um, and finally, uh, on item 4B, I know it's later on, but I'll be gone. Um, <clears throat> this item allows for the, um, you know, the, uh, outside dining area, and it gives considerations where there's obstructions in the public right-of-way, but it limits it only to where the sidewalks are 12 feet wide or shorter. I don't understand why that 12 foot wide is important, because especially in between San Vicente and Robertson up here, the businesses on the north side have more patio space than the ones on the south side because the placement of the tree boxes, which are on the south side, they're four feet away from the curb, and on the north side, they're adjacent to the curb, and so that cuts in half the amount of space that businesses on the south side can have. And so the, you're ending up with disparate impacts from a policy that seems fair and reasonable. So I'd hope you, that you'd consider to provide uh, some leniency consideration or otherwise amend that item to help out those businesses uh, who are negatively impacted by, the, by that ordinance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. Mark Bayer to be followed by Kimberly Winnick. Hey, John, it's nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, so a couple things. Um, a few things I just heard about, about the sidewalk space. Uh, I would really appreciate as much space as possible for pedestrians on the sidewalks um, in general. Uh, somebody was talking about scooters. I completely agree. I think it's sort of crazy. And even more crazy than the scooters are those remote control robots on our sidewalks like seriously though it's not a joke it's that's pathetic uh i wasn't ever asked if i wanted that um i'm sure that the majority of citizens to tax paying citizens in this city d d d don't want those machines on our sidewalks either i n noticed they they could get in the way with myself and m my n neighbors frequently um a few other things um, the trees, uh, it's a d d d d d a g g g god d d d d d damn shame that um, the city is choosing to cut down a ton of perfectly healthy trees along that line our city streets. 
there's there were signs on them saying we're going to cut these trees to do down because of some disease that some arborist came up with if you have a problem call this person and i think it's pathetic those trees have been here longer than any of us and i also heard actually john this was when i appreciate you being at plumber park on saturdays and in that same time that i brought this issue up with you somebody who was there with you also actually told me that that's not even true about the disease that the true reason that they're being cut down is because some rich person's threatening to sue the city so i think like all of us need to stand up for what's right consistently um, and let's make a city a, 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 a so much, better Mark. place for everybody. So thank you. I'll have a nice day. Thank you so much, Mark. And Helen, maybe you can talk to Mark a little bit about the trees. Thank you. Um, Kimberly Winnick to be followed by um, S. Bitterman. Good evening. Thank you and happy almost spring. I live on Huntley Drive, south of Melrose, part of West Hollywood West. I know I've spoken with some of you before. I'm here because we had a process that started more than 10 years ago to beautify Melrose. And there was a question of public art. We had public meetings. We didn't like the first proposal for the area between Norwich and Huntley. There was a lot of public comment. There was a lot of redrafting by the city, the City Arts Commission the city council, and a lot of neighbors got involved repeatedly to try to figure out a good design. We came up with a design that we really liked, and there, again, there was a lot of public exposure, there was a lot of discussion, and yet, as the Melrose project was being done, the sidewalks were being done, all of a sudden, I learned, as I walked back and forth every day to come swim in this wonderful property, that, um, they aren't finishing the job between Norwich and Huntley because somebody didn't want trees in front of their building. Now that somebody happens to own, if it is true that Ben Soleimani is trying to block this project, I have a real problem with that because due process says he has owned properties along here for decades. He knew what was going on. He had an opportunity to come out and speak. He didn't. I know he didn't because I was at those meetings. My neighbors were at those meetings. We were trying to have something nice done. Now what we have is a dustbin covered with a whole bunch of signs telling people not to park because it looks like a parking lot. All the trees have been taken down. It's bare, it's dusty, it's ugly. And in front of him, well now he's got this whole stretch where we were very careful to say he should never be allowed to treat that space in front of that store as his private space, he's now got sandwich signs out there from the sidewalk all the way back to the building, letting everybody know that his business is open. This needs to be fixed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kimberly. S. Bitterman to be followed by Cindy Bitterman. Hi. Uh, yeah, hi, Shem Bitterman. And um, hi, thank you all for uh, taking the time to hear me. I'm just uh, speaking in favor of uh, I think it's uh, item 5A. I know I'm going out of order, but I just it's, I want to get home to dinner. But I just want to speak strongly in favor of uh, traffic uh, multimodality. I think the city needs it. I think it's way past time. We've seen it successfully operate in cities all around the world. Uh, it only enhances the cities. Uh, it makes them tourist destinations. It makes them wonderful for the residents. It cleans the air. It provides room for trees and other uh, things. I urge you all to vote uh, yes on 5A and particularly on option one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Enjoy your dinner. Uh, Cindy Bitterman, please come on down because I think you're waiting for supper. Yeah, yeah, he needs his dinner. And guess we'll be making that dinner. Um, <laughs> so uh, Cindy Bitterman, I concur with everything my husband just said, Shem Bitterman. Um, but I, I know that corridor very well because I worked at Laurel Span School for a little while. Um, I am an uh, LAUSD school nurse for like 20 years. And so I would really appreciate you a vote on, on this item because I do want the students to get to school safely. It goes all the way down to almost to Melrose Elementary, which I was actually at for 17 years. So. Um, 
I would love for our students to have a fun way to get to school and have exercise before they get to school. Also, it provides streets and shade, which we want. Thank you, and thank you for having us tonight. Thank you, thank you so much, Cindy. And Sam, take her out to dinner. Don't make her cook dinner tonight. Um, all right, <laughs> with that last comment, that concludes public comment. Thank you so much, everyone. We uh, have city somebody on Zoom. Mayor, oh, we, we have, have someone on Zoom, yeah. that's right. I usually go to Zoom first, and look at how it screwed me up now. Our last speaker is on Zoom, Adam Darvish. You'll have two minutes. Please press star six to unmute. Good evening, Mayor Patterson and Vice Mayor Byers, Council and staff. Uh, I want to thank first uh, Council Member Shine for reminding me to call my mother and sisters on Caspian Sea for reminding me about Nowruz and the time and the day, so thank you so much. Um, I wanted to thank you for agenda item 2.0, co-sponsorship of uh, World uh, Dog Day 2024. And at the same time, I wanted to remind you that there's also the um, Wild Animal, International Wild, Wild Animal Day on March 3rd. On this day, I had a friend uh, that I've had for many years, a little squirrel that was the sweetest thing on the planet that I look forward to seeing on the weekends or whenever I was home or leaving the house in the morning to go to work. Um, this this um, squirrel climbed the uh, power line as usual to avoid cars or speeding cars on the RV and I heard a big bang and apparently it just happened that the squirrel touched both uh, line, hot lines and got zapped and got killed. So I had to collect uh, his body from the sidewalk in front of my house, and it made me wonder, so I did some research and found out some cities use um, a simple plastic cover to insulate the transformer for, so to prevent any any animals or birds or any animals that could climb the post uh, get electrocuted. And I called SCE and opened the ticket at least for the transformer in front of my house, and I'm just disappointed that in California, in such a state that we care so much about wildlife, this is happening. I assume that the transformers were, were insulated, but they're not. Yeah. Um, there's a slow movement on doing them. So I'm hoping that our city would take this in initiative, although it's out of our jurisdiction. Maybe it could highlight that uh, SC, Southern California Edison, and put it on their list, at least to get it done in our cities. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Adam. Is that it, Janet? That's all for public comment. Yes. Sounds good. We're going to move on to the city manager's report. City Manager Wilson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, and City Council members. Um, I want to add my congratulations to Eugene Alper on his um, next move and, um, and thank him for all the work that he's done um, in serving the West Hollywood community for over almost 30 years. Um, just a couple of comments related to some of the comments from the public. Um, there were comments related to the Olympics as well as the um, Melrose, the Weaver's Walk on Melrose. Both of those, there'll be items from staff <clears throat> on both of those subjects coming in April. Um, and then with respect to the comments regarding um, the social services um, documents um, from David Nash. We are printing larger uh, documents with larger font for that. Thank you, that concludes my comments. Thank you so much, City Manager Wilson. Madam City Clerk, may I get a fiscal impact report on the consent calendar? Yes, Mayor. With the additions of items 6A, 6C, 6D, 6E, 6F, and the removal of to G. The fiscal impact on consent is 2,330,031 in expenditures, 1,332 in revenues, and 10,235 in waived fees. S sounds good. I see a request to motion by Councilmember Heilman. I'll move that we approve. And a second by Vice Mayor Byers. And I think yeah. we're going to do a voice yeah, we'll vote again. Voice it might vote. be a voice vote night. <laughs> That's perfectly okay. fine. Councilmember Heilman. Aye. Thank you. Councilmember Meister. Aye. Councilmember Schein. 
I with the um, uh, with my disclosure again for um, the two items. Thank you. Vice Mayor Byers. Yes. And Mayor Erickson. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. That concludes the consent calendar portion of the evening. We're going to move on to our first public hearing. We do have three, technically, items 3B and 3C are moved into one item. And we're going to move on to 3A, zone text amendment to lengthen the initial minimum dwelling lease term for individual-owned condominiums and single-family residents. Uh, the public hearing is now open. Uh, are there any disclosures from my colleagues? Uh, Councilmember Meister? Councilmember Schein? No. Uh, Councilmember Heilman, Vice Member Rice, I have none as well. Um, Madam City Clerk, the question of the evening, how was this item noticed? As required by law. Wonderful, we love that. Staff, will you please introduce yourself and lead us through a staff report? Do my colleagues want an abbreviated staff report on this one? Yes. Yes? I, I don't need a staff report. You don't need a staff report? I don't need abbreviated staff report will be lovely. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council. Uh, Nick Marisich, Community Development Director, joined by uh, the Long Range Planning Manager, Francisco Contreras, and Associate Planner, Michelle Montenegro. Hello, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and City Council. Um, this item is a zone text amendment to lengthen the initial minimum lease term, specifically for single family residences and condos. Um, in August 2020, the original ordinance was adopted and it was adopted to require one-year minimum lease terms for all dwelling units within the city. Uh, the only exception to these items would be uh, single-family residences and condos. Um, this item is to present a proposed zone text amendment. Give me one moment to just... Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. This uh, item. Hold on one second. So we are, we can't see anything. You're aware of that, right? No. Okay. Do you need us, all okay. Do you need us to pause so we can get the items up on our item? All right. We're going to take a, we're going to pause for a second. The, I would remind my colleagues the public hearing is still open. Do not talk to each other. Um, but we'll take a two minute break. Do you think that's enough for you to fix it? Okay, we'll give you five minutes and then you'll let us know how it comes. Okay, sounds good. Five minute break everyone, apologies to everyone and we'll be right back with you.
and resume the meeting. If everyone could take their seats, please. If you fix it, you fix it. If you don't, you don't. It's fine. All right, Nick and staff, <laughs> uh, amazing team, please continue. Thank you. So uh, this item was brought as a zone text amendment as is to the Planning Commission in August 2023. Ultimately, they adopted a recommendation to move forward with the zone text amendment as is, which is to modify the initial minimum lease term for condos and single family residences from 31 days to 60 days. Analysis was done and it was informed by the strategic plan and the general plan of the city to balance residential livability and economic development of vital industries within the area. Some proxy indicators that were used to determine the proposed zone text amendment was that 8% of all positions within the county of LA in the entertainment sector were categorized as gig jobs. The average tenure of contract and temporary employees was 10.1 weeks in 2021. Some housing consideration was understanding the housing supply within the city. There's approximately 23,000 occupied dwelling units and about 6,358 units affected by this provision, which are condos and single family residences. So of that about 6,300 units, 72% are occupied by owners today and 28% are occupied by renters. Um, Long range planning staff also worked with rent stabilization division to gather some statistics of the new non rent stabilized registry. So of the 243 units that were condos and single family residences, 3.3% had an initial minimum lease term that was recorded of 24, 24 months and the overwhelming 97% had an initial lease term of 12 months. It should be noted that none had an initial minimum lease term of less than a year. Some code compliance noise data is that about 57% of all total noise data collected within the last year was attributed to apartments, 2% to condos, and 26% to single family residential. Since the proportion of each unit varies so differently within the city, of all the apartments, 2% received a complaint, and 6.3% of all single family residences received a complaint. Uh, staff did community engagement by activating the new Engage WeHo platform. Two feedback tools were utilized. One was poll data and the second was descriptive comments. So overwhelmingly, 53% of users decided that they would like to maintain the minimum initial lease term of 31 days, which is no change. And of, this, of the descriptive comments, 56% was opposed to the proposed so text amendment. The proposed zone text amendment would modify 31 days initial minimum lease terms for condos and single family residents to 60 days. That concludes staff presentation. Thank you so much. Do my colleagues have any questions for staff? Councilmember Heilman? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the report. Um, uh, my question is really for Lauren Langer. Um, I know that there's a provision in the civil code regarding condos. Uh, it's actually section 4741, um, and it, it's really geared towards condo associations, which limits their ability to restrict rentals. I'm wondering if that creates any kind of problem in terms of this pr proposed uh, ordinance. It doesn't really prohibit cities from adopting policies, but I want to make sure we're not running afoul of state law. I don't believe it does because for that exact reason, it was a regulation on what the um, condo associations could do and doesn't speak to any of the city's police powers. And so that was our thinking about it. Um, but I can pull the statute up one more time before you vote and just confirm that we're looking at the same language. Yeah. Um, I mean, the policy behind it obviously is to allow short-term rentals in condos. Uh, something that most condo owners are not really in favor of unless they're engaged in it. Um, so I, 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 my other question for staff is uh, why the recommendation of 60 days rather than 90 days rather than a year? Of course. So the original directive um, analyzed or called out certain timelines. So one of them was 60 days and one of them was 90 days, um, as well as the year to match apartment units. 60 days was selected because based on statistics, we found that the average tenure for contract and temporary use um, uh, jobs were 10.1 weeks. So we wanted to make sure we were under that limit. So therefore temporary housing needs could be utilized or you know, met uh, for industries. Um, there's no, 
Oh, and healthcare reporting as well. We um, analyze data from Cedar sinai as well as UCLA Ronald Reagan, and those timelines matched up with about 60 days. Okay, but if, if for those of us who don't think our permanent housing should be used for those short-term uses, you have no objection to us doing a one-year period just like we do for apartment? No. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Councilmember Meister. Uh, well, actually, Councilmember Hammond um, asked most of my questions. I guess the one question I would have um, for, uh, for City Attorney Langer is um, we, apparently there is a state law about how long someone can stay in a hotel and still be considered a guest versus a resident? Is, is I mean, I, th I think the standard industry practice is less than 30 days. You're still considered a transient. More than 30 days right. is when you would become a... But is that the state-defined rule? Because my, my point is that we've always, we've had 30 days as being that, that um, you know, wall, right? And so it kind of makes sense that if you're going to raise it to 60 days or 90 days or whatever, that we should be able to allow pe uh, people who want to stay at a, um, a hotel that, for instance, has the amenities, has a kitchenette, has a living room space, to be able to have that, the ability to use a, a hotel versus housing, which, as Councilmember Heilman said, you know, is housing um, in a time when we're in a housing crisis. Uh, so the idea is, is there something that we can do or direct staff to do to enable hotels to exceed 30 days? Um, and I know Councilmember Heilman maybe has some I think the problem is also from a landlord tenant's standpoint, they then become tenants and they're subject to the protections of the rent control ordinance um, and the, the state laws regarding eviction. So if somebody is staying in a hotel more than 30 days, they're no longer subject to the TOT tax and they're also uh, no longer considered a transient, they're considered a tenant and that's that's why the 30-day provision has always been in effect. So my question is, is, is that based on our rent stabilization ordinance, or is it based on, in other words, if we changed our ordinance to be 60 days or 90 days, would that be a problem then? Would, would those people then still be guests rather than yeah. tenants? I believe it's state law, but I, I'm gonna let, yeah. I think Lauren's gonna have to do some research on okay. it. I'd have to look at that, but if you make it 60 days that they're not considered tenants, that's 30 more days that they're not getting the benefits of all the protections under your rent stabilization Yeah, order. but they're in a hotel. So they shouldn't expect mm -hmm. benefits of being a tenant if you're staying at a hotel. I mean, you, where, you, where, you, where that line gets crossed is actually when someone is in, is in a, a, a residential house or condominium versus if you go, you go to stay at a hotel. You're a guest in a hotel. I don't think I don't think the the um, uh, expectation mm. is is that that person is a resident if they're staying at a hotel because they can only stay at a hotel because they can't spend 90 days, uh, uh, 60 days, or whatever at a if we change this this ordinance. Yeah, right. um, I I also want to um, just. Um, uh, confirm that we did some initial analysis just to get some information. Uh, we'd have to do a little bit more research, but from the research that we've gathered so far, just initially, preliminarily, it does seem that it's under under state law that a person who occupies a motel or a hotel um, as a primary residence for 30 or more days yeah. becomes a tenant and has certain legal protections, including the right to due process before being evicted. Um, so typically, motel and hotel operators prefer that their occupants maintain transient occupancy rather than obtaining tenant status right. because, unlike tenants, they can evict um, uh, transient occupants. Um, and then in addition to that, per the municipal code, um, if a person stays longer than 30 days in one of our hotels, um, they are exempt from the, the TOT 
um, for example, as a. Right. As but an, as we an can change. We can change our own laws. We can't change. We can't change the state necessarily law. Necessarily, state law unless we lobby to change it. Correct. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Shine. Do you have questions? No. Nope. Vice Mayor Byers. Yeah. Can you just pull back the slide? I believe you had data about how many uh, units were affected total. For noise complaint. Not the noise complaints, oh. the amount of one year or less leases. Mm. Thank you. That answers my question, thank you. Uh, um, I th thank you very much. Uh, so the feedback is overwhelmingly negative. And so my question is, is why are you recommending that we do this then? The community has made it very clear, some of these comments are colorful. So I'm just wondering then why are you coming to us with this increase? I mean, I think there's a lot of questions that come up here, but it just seems like this is something that might be uh, further overreach than actuality. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, one of the considerations that the council gave us was to go back to the planning commission to, s to see what the planning commission thought of the proposal. So we brought the proposal to the Planning Commission and the Planning Commission recommended to the City Council that they um, you know, consider a 60-day um, requirement. Um, so we're just bringing forth the Planning Commission recommendation. Um, but it's up to Council to do as, as they wish. But, but why did they recommend it? Um, they recommended it for some of the um, you know, items that were included in the staff report. They did have mixed feelings. Um, there were some, you know, considerations as to like, why are we exactly doing this? Um, is, it re is there really a need? Um, but they did also um, had in their back of their minds sort of examples of, you know, maybe historically, maybe more hearsay, um, you know, the party house incidents that were happening back in the day with some of the uh, like Airbnb rentals that were happening for extended periods of time, where there was a lot of noise that was being generated from these party houses and single family residential zones. So there was some of that discussion that there could be, you know, potential impacts to some of the residential neighborhoods if that were allowed to happen. So, but, you know, at the end, they came up to a consensus and they voted recommendation for 60 days. I will also add that one of the major talking points for Planning Commission was the lack of data or data points that were reliable. So new information has been presented since the Planning Commission, which includes the registry data, as well as the noise complaint data that was refined since then. So this is new information since the PC recommendation that may be considered. And uh, forgive me because I, I, my iPad thingy isn't working, but I don't recall there being a large preponderance of party house problems in the city, but I don't know, Danny, is that something that's plaguing the city and the code department? But I mean, if the issue is this is to stop party house people, that's gonna be the word of the day, um, but um, then, and if there isn't a problem, then I guess isn't this just government overreach? And that's a redundant question, but yeah. we're, I, well, I have a, I, I, my question is, is, is there a, are we, do we have the numbers of party house violations handy that we're facing? I think the closest proxy is the noise complaint data, okay. which we gathered since the PC recommendation. Okay, thank you so much, and sorry my iPad froze. <laughs> um, do we have public comment? Nope. Uh, Mark, if you want to give public comment, you have to come up and speak into the thing, and you'll have two minutes. Yeah, I mean, it's not going to be two minutes. I just uh, agree with what you're saying. I think uh, what's the point? It seems like this legislation w would just result in more restriction, especially against a more vulnerable class. Um, the ones who aren't homeowners. And if a homeowner wants to rent their home for 30 days, why should the city stop them from, from doing that? So I think it's restricting homeowners and uh, 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 non-homeowners, so uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Mark. Do we have any other more public, we have one on Zoom? One on Zoom, yes. Sounds good. And in an effort not to butcher his last name, I will go with David K. David, please press star mute to un 
star six to unmute, you'll have two minutes. Hello? Go ahead, David. Hi, this is David Gaishan with the Apartment Associations of Greater Los Angeles. The imposition of a longer minimum lease term for single family residences and condominiums is unwarranted and will cause substantial harm to homeowners and renters alike. While the city claims that this restriction is intended to prevent frequent relocation of renters, it fails to adequately recognize the valid reasons for allowing short -term, short, shorter lease terms for SFRs and condos. Entertainment industry workers and military personnel often require short-term rentals to provide them with the ability to pay their mortgages and keep their homes while they are away for work or serving their country. To require longer-term minimal, minimum rentals means that homeowners would have to forego an entire month's worth of rent that may cause substantial financial stress and may keeping their homes more difficult. Additionally, families with children or other loved ones receiving receiving needed medical care such as cleft palate surgeries and other life-changing operations and treatments would be unable to afford to stay nearby for shorter term stays. The staff report states that the average stay at Cedar sinai is 25 days. Many families already stressed financially and emotionally would be unable to afford to stay locally if this ordinance increases the minimum stay from 31 days to 60 days. Further, this ordinance is not supported by the community or substantial data. According to the polling conducted by the city, the majority of respondents, 53%, supported no change to the existing ordinance and no other option even received 20% of the support. In addition, the city's expanded rental registry is still in its necessity stages. The limited data available from this registry does not provide enough data to make any assumptions whatsoever, much less that additional changes are needed at this time and in this manner. We urge the city council to reject the proposed ordinance and stay within the existing ordinance until and unless there is clear convincing data to warrant specific changes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. And I believe we have one more public commenter in chambers, and that's Rick Watts. Thank you, Mayor. Rick Watts, City of West Hollywood. Um, I, I think it, it should be noted on the uh, uh, one of the graphics that you had up there, the, the number of units that, that are uh, potentially uh, affected by this. Um, uh, over 6,300, which is a, a big chunk of the housing in West Hollywood. And it should also be remembered that that housing was approved to be built as permanent housing. Uh, it's just that unfortunately in the, in, along the way, uh, um, Airbnb and such have, uh, have come along and have taken a lot of that housing off of the permanent housing market. And that is part of what drives up the prices uh, for, uh, for, for the renters in this city. Um, and it's a problem not just here, but in, in so many other cities, and it adds to the homeless problem. I have no objection to, 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 uh, to, uh, to property owners renting out spare rooms. If they're, you know, they're owner-occupied, I have no problem with that. Um, but uh, whether they are uh, condos or private houses or uh, apartments, again, these, these were built and permitted with the idea that these were going to be uh, occupied for long-term housing. And, uh, and this is a, a pretty big chunk of, uh, of, of housing that is, that is affected. Um, and I, I think one of the purposes of this ordinance should be uh, to discourage short-term rental. And uh, to the extent that 30 days doesn't quite do it, I'm in favor of raising, the, uh, uh, raising it to 60, 90, or more. Um, again, with the exception of uh, owner-occupied units, pe you know, people wanting to, to uh, rent out their, uh, their granny flat or a spare room in their house. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rick. Any more public comments? Nope. All right. I'm going to now close the public testimony portion of the public hearing and move on to council deliberations. Would any of my colleagues like to start? Council member, oh, sorry, Council yes. Member yes. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, you referred to the public sentiment being overwhelmingly opposed. Is that based on the That's Engage I'm... WeHo? So I, I guess this is a bit of a question, but a comment. And that is, why are we being presented with this data as if it's actually reflective of the sentiment when it is completely invalid from a statistical standpoint? Engage WeHo is something that 
people who have a point of view on this can go on and express their point of view. So it has the classic bias of any kind of survey of self-selection. The people who have a, a passionate view are the ones who are gonna go and engage in this poll and respond. And who are those people? Most likely people who are most passionate are the ones who have a financial stake in it. The ones who are renting out their condos and single family homes for short term rental. So of course they're opposed. The apartment association is opposed because they want um, owners to be able to use their condos and their homes to make as much money as they want. I want our homes and our condos to be used as they were intended for long-term residential stays for people who are actually living in the community. So I, I guess this transcends this particular item. The Engage WeHo, in my mind, it's a nice gesture, but it, we shouldn't be presented with it as if it has any statistical validity. It is not a valid polling device, it is really ridiculous that we're staking our decision making on that. Um, so putting that aside, in terms of the merits, uh, again, I think we should require condos and single family homes to be leased as most people enter into a lease for a year. I think that's what we should be aiming for. That's what permanent residency looks like. It's what most landlords who are in the business uh, are gonna rent for. And this notion that we have to be the, the saviors of people who are coming here for short-term stays for Cedar sinai I don't buy that. First of all, the charges here are far more expensive than if they were to rent a hotel room. So we shouldn't be doing this to try to save money for those people visiting people at Cedars who are there for long-term care. We should be telling them to do what's cheaper, which is staying in our hotels. Um, so I, I'm opposed to, I, I support the text amendment, but I don't support the 60 days. I would advocate that it be much longer than that, and I would advocate for a year. Thank you so much. Councilmember Meister. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I agree with Councilmember Heilman. Uh, first of all, the idea that we're inhibiting economic development if requiring 60 or 90 days is kind of ludicrous because there are plenty of hotels in the city and many have apartment-like amenities with kitchens and living rooms. Um, and if someone is here for business and wants to be located in a more home-like environment, including in a neighborhood, um, there, are, there are hotels available. We'd actually be in improving our business's uh, economic situations if we, if we get people out of, get temporary people out of residential homes that should be long-term permanent housing and, and put them in hotels. Um, for, for Agla to say that, you know, that the, the people who are going to houses and condos are paying less, that's not true. In, in my neighborhood, uh, there's one house on my street that rents out for $10,000 to, to $30,000 a month. I think the average is like $20,000. Uh, that's for, that's for a, a single family home, whereas um, La Park, uh, which has four, uh, 54 one-bedroom suites with full kitchenettes, and the Montrose has 29, and they're both in residential neighborhoods. The average price for a 30-day stay is $6,500 plus tax. So to say that, that, that there aren't um, financially uh, you know, feasible alternatives is just, is just disingenuous. So um, this isn't about money then, you know, it's not about, housing, um, renting by the month cheaper than hotels, that's just not, that's just not the case. Um, second of all, the fabric of neighborhoods change when people move in for just 30 or 60 days. Those people, for the most part, don't wanna be part of a neighborhood, they're not neighbors. And bottom line, as Councilmember Heilman uh, said, during a housing crisis especially, Housing is for people who want to be here longer term than an eight week movie shoot, and they should be the priority. Um, and so 
uh, and as uh, Council Member Hammond said, which I was also going to say, this is a self-selected survey. It's not a randomly selected scientific survey. And again, you know, we keep getting caught in that same every single time. You know, we, and we keep saying, give us a scientific, randomly selected survey. And we keep getting uh, self-selected surveys where, you know, who knows who went on there to, um, to answer this survey. The other thing is, the numbers that we got from, on the, um, from uh, the rent stabilization, uh, uh, it's only 5% of what, you know, of how many we have, right? We have five, over 5,000 uh, single family homes and condos, and only five per, uh, less than 5% so far have registered uh, with the city. And so, um, you know, we, I, I don't know that we can go by that because, I, again, I do know that especially in, in the West Hollywood West neighborhood, there are several houses on every single block that are renting out their homes, that, the homes for 30, 60, you know, maybe 90 days, but definitely not a year. So I'm, I'm also for the zone text amendment to lengthen the initial minimal, uh, minimum dwelling lease term. Uh, however, I would also like it to be longer than 60 days. Uh, if we can only settle on 60 days for now, I think 60 days is better than 30 days. And I still would also like to give some direction about um, talking to our state representatives about, about uh, what constitutes um, a tenant because if we define it as even long, longer term, we should, our hotel should be able to benefit from having a shorter term uh, stays. Thank, Thank you, you Mayor. Thank you so much. Um, before I go to Council Member Shine, City Attorney Langer, um, to go with what Council Member Heilman said, would we have to re-notice this or can the council, before I go to my other two colleagues, could we make it a year tonight? So it's something that I want to discuss with the planning staff because substantial modifications have to go back to the planning yeah. commission. And I think we want to know from the staff if the planning commission discussed other terms and they've, and they've weighed all the factors associated with different terms, you could probably make the change tonight if, if the planning commission didn't discuss different terms and you probably want to send it back to them. Thank you so much. Council Member Shine? Did they discuss? Are you discussing now? Or I'm going to defer to my staff since this was prior to my joining the city. <laughs> Sound, sounds good, Nick. <laughs> um, in the Planning Commission staff report, there was the three options laid out, the 30 days, the 31 days, 60 days, and a year. There wasn't um, oral discussion done by the Planning Commission on a longer term, but they recognized it within the staff report. Okay. So we do have the discretion to do one year tonight then, if they discuss it? If it was it in sounds the, like it was presented to the Planning Commission in the staff report, but the Planning Commission didn't. Correct. Yeah. Interested in a year? Yeah, we, we provided them with those three options. It was either like the, the 30 days, leave it as is, move it to 60, or something longer, such as 90 days. Um, so what or does beyond. that mean for us? Did it say a year? It the said. Did, go ahead. In the staff report. Yes, it okay. was presented. It pre okay. You yes, presented a year option to the Planning Commission. Okay. 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 Um, thank you, uh, Mayor. I, um, I agree with uh, my colleagues that have spoken. Uh, we have uh, taken so many measures to uh, really combat uh, short-term rentals in our city. And um, uh, it doesn't make any sense to me that we would treat single family homes differently, or condos, than we do um, our multifamily uh, residential uh, renters. And um, I do agree. I, it, Really, people can, if they want to say 60 days, they can stay at one hotel and then go to another one. And isn't there, uh, we have um, longer term stays available. Isn't AK Properties, you can stay there a little bit longer or no? There are certain properties within the Sunset yeah. Specific Plan that are authorized for a distinct period of time, I believe it's 10 years, to offer slightly different yeah. terms. Okay. So there's, there's a lot available, and um, it, it's... 
I've, I've heard so many complaints of uh, quality of life, uh, people coming and uh, having parties. It just, um, uh, everything that's been said, and I'm, I'm actually in favor of a year as well um, for, um, for this item. Thank you so much, Council Member Sine. Vice Mayor Byers. Thank you. I, too, am supportive of a year. I think as presented for a solve for the party house problem, I didn't quite understand the rationale, but in seeing the data about the usage of leases as they exist and really in stepping back and thinking about the vision we share for our community and how the available housing should be used, this feels like the right solution for us. So I support a year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I agree with my colleagues. Uh Please go. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, I agree with my colleagues. Um, I, I definitely think that um, what we're talking about in terms of short-term rentals in some of the non-empirical data that we won't use, uh, uh, it did mention in some of the people that were supportive of this is that, you know, longer lease terms prevent STRs and everything that we're hearing about, especially from the members of the public. Um, but I definitely think 30 to 60 days makes it confusing. I do agree that the one-year standardized thing is exactly how businesses run within these types of corporations. And so for that, and as long as it's, um, it was mentioned by the Planning Commission and City Attorney Langer has no issue to it. And $20,000, hello, that's an expensive house. Um, uh, I, I feel like it's, Sounds like we have a unanimous motion, if someone would like to make it to a... Sure. So I remember one of the issues that uh, the realtors had with this is the fact that uh, sometimes someone will sell their home and then they'll lease back for a couple of months because their new home isn't ready. So I'm just wondering if we could carve out uh, an exemption for that situation where someone who's living in their home was their home, they sold their home, they're leasing it back for you know less than a year because their home is not ready. I mean, it's easy enough to tell that they're they've been here. I think that that would make sense to carve out that exemption. I think it's already in the code well, for, a, for a lease back. <laughs> well, then there you go. I will say. Oh. Uh, I have a question. Uh, something to to add. I think um, given that this is a substantial change, uh, let's make sure that there is really great time and notice given to uh, all the owners that are going to be affected so that we don't have a situation where people think they don't they didn't know and then they're going to get fine heavy fines when this, when this happens um, I will mention I failed to mention the presentation but for the engage WeHo we did send out a mailer to all property owners and occupants of single family residences and condos so they're at least aware that's being presented today and of the zone text amendment in general uh, I, I understand but after this is voted on it's really important that that uh, the homeowners and condo owners have we could also uh, usually it's effective 30 days after the second reading. We could also agree that it's not effective until six months or it's effective yeah. the first of the year. So I, I think your point is is right. We need to give people sufficient time. So yeah. some of them may already have committed to short-term leases uh, yeah. during the summer months. So uh, we don't want to put people in a position where what they were trying to do was legal and it no longer is, so. Yeah. Sounds good. Do you, uh, City Attorney, do you have a suggestion? I, I agree with that, adding a longer um, time to the effective date of the ordinance would accomplish that and provide time for some noticing and um, making, and some outreach to make the condo owners and single family homeowners aware. I wanted to say two other things just to be clear for the record. That the code says if the council proposes to adopt a substantial modification to the amendment not previously considered by the commission, that's when you send it back. So as long as the commission considered three options, there were three options in your staff report today, I think it meets the test for not having to go back to the planning commission. Okay. I, I would suggest that we make the operative date January 1st. But the reality is this is it's going to be second read, 30 days. Yeah. We'd already be into June. That would give an extra six months before the effective date. Sounds good. 
And the other thing I just wanted to respond was your question about 4741 in the civil code. Um, the civil code language is very clear that it only applies to um, the governing bodies of the homeowners association and their documents. There's no case law on point, and so somebody could raise the argument, but there's nothing in the statute that speaks at all to changing a city's police powers to regulate tenancies. Great, thank you. We good? <laughs> Sounds good. All right, Vice Mayor Byers, you request a motion. Yes, um, I think we're all in agreement. Um, so I will move to amend section 19.36275 uh, for the requirement of a one year lease and the noticing to, or this law to go into effect on January 1st, 2025. Sounds good. And Is that right? Okay. I believe that's everything. <laughs> and I'll second it. Yeah. Okay, Council, Council Member Hoban seconds. Thank you so much. Any other with the exemption? You're good? Yeah. As well as Lauren. Yep. I don't want to confirm with the planning staff the exemption for lease backs is in there, correct? Yes. Okay. It's in code. Yeah. Perfect. All right. We're going to take a vote. All right. City Clerk. Thank you. Councilmember Heidelman. Aye. Uh, Councilmember Meister. Yes. Councilmember Shine. Yes. Vice Mayor Byers. Yes. And Mayor Erickson. Yes. Thank you so much, everyone. That moves 5-0. We are now going to take items 3B, time limit extension for discretionary permits and entitlement seeking development agreements, and 3C, an urgency and regular ordinance establishing a process for the renewal of expired building permits for development projects near completion uh, together. Um, the public hearing is now open as staff does a switcheroo. Are there any disclosures from my council members on items 3B and 3C? I'm going to start to my right. Council Member Meister? Yeah, I did speak with um, the representative for the former Arts Club about matters in the staff report. Thank you. Council Member Shine? I also spoke to the representative for the former Arts Club. Thank you. Council Member Heilman? I spoke to them. I also spoke to Alyssa Pastor, who's representing one of the um, individuals who has acquired one of the residential properties. Vice Mayor Byers? I spoke to representatives on behalf of the Arts Club. And I spoke to representatives from all three, uh, um, uh, Alyssa, Oliver, and the representative for the Arts Club as well. Madam City Clerk. How was this meeting? How was this hearing noticed? As required by law. Thank you so much. Last time you were going to have to say that tonight. Um, all right, staff representatives, please go ahead and introduce yourself um, and give us a presentation. And I, we're going to take a full presentation on both of these items. Great. Good evening. Still Nick Marisich, still Director of Community Development, joined by uh, some more from the Community Development Department, more staff, uh, Doug Vu, Senior Planner, Ben Galan, our Building and Safety Manager, and Jennifer Alkire, uh, Planning Manager for the Current and Historic Preservation Planning Team. And I will hand it off to Doug to start with the presentation for item uh, 3B. Great. Thank you. Um, so, good evening, Mayor Erickson, members of the City Council. Uh, as Nick mentioned, Doug Vu of Department Staff. So, item 3B before you is an ordinance that would uh, provide a six-month extension uh, to the time limits established in the zoning ordinance for permitted projects that seek development agreements. So the, the challenges and fiscal impacts attributed to the pandemic-related economic downturn um, continue to affect... Sorry? No. Oh. Hold on one second. Apologies about that. Uh, IT, can I get the presentation for item 3B up, please? Let me start over. Um, so item 3B before you is the ordinance uh, that would provide a six month extension to the time limits established in the zoning ordinance for permitted projects that seek development agreements. Um, so just really briefly, you know, the, the challenges and fiscal impacts attributed to the pandemic related economic downturn 
um, continue to affect the development industry, especially construction of the larger entitled projects in the city, um, including the former Arts Club and Melrose Triangle projects. So this ordinance addresses the challenges that these projects are experiencing um, and is a strategy intended to give the city, through development agreements, um, the tools to require that they are constructed in a timely manner, um, that existing on-site conditions are remedied, and project sites do not remain vacant indefinitely. So although the ordinance provides the additional time needed to negotiate and execute these development agreements, um, it fully preserves the city's discretion in negotiating and entering into these agreements, which will be brought back to the Planning Commission and City Council in the future for consideration at public hearings. Um, and while the ordinance identifies the former Arts Club and Melrose Triangle projects, um, particularly because those two projects have development agreement applications in place, um, this ordinance will actually remain in effect through the end of the calendar year should other projects uh, choose to pursue this option. Um, and finally, I just wanted to note that the, the amended draft ordinance includes subsection 2G, which clarifies that a project cannot proceed until the development agreement is effective. So that's my summary for item 3B, and I will hand it over to Ben for item 3C. Good evening, Mayor Erickson and council members. My name is Ben Galan, Building and Safety Manager. Uh, the this, this second item is asking council to consider an urgency ordinance and first reading of an ordinance to amend the municipal code to establish a process for the renewal of expired building permits for projects that are near completion. The California Building Code establishes time limitations for when a building permit expires. The current code requires the owner to begin construction within 12 months of permit issuance and demonstrate progress in construction with inspections. And if none are scheduled and construction stops for 180 days, the permits automatically expire. The code allows owners to request a maximum of two extensions at 100 days each to help keep their permits valid. When a permit expires, the code requires applicants to submit a new plan check application, pay fees, and begin the, re the review process over again. The city currently has a few buildings that are near completion with expired permits. Many developers struggled through the uncertainty of the pandemic with inflation and the financing crisis affecting the ability for some of these projects to be completed. This item before you outlines a framework that allows for these nearly completed projects to renew their permits and restart the project without having to resubmit a new project. The goal of this ordinance is to streamline the reissuing process and allow, and allow developers to take over these almost complete projects, revive and complete them, provide relief to our neighborhoods, and in most cases, add much needed residential units to our, uh, to our city. Staff is requesting that City Council approve this urgency ordinance and introduce for first reading an ordinance that establishes a process for the renewal of ex expired permits. And with that, thank you, and we're open for any questions. Thank you so much. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to my colleagues for questions. Um, Councilmember Hammond? Yeah, I had one question for, for Ben. The, um, uh, we, we heard from Alyssa Pastor, who's an attorney representing um, somebody who's taken over some of the residential projects, and her position is that the language in this urgency ordinance isn't broad enough to cover all of those residential projects that got stalled, and I think at least my intention would be for all of those projects to be captured by this so that they could go forward. Um, and, and so the neighborhood doesn't, you know, they're not faced with a half-built project in their neighborhood. Um, have you had a chance to consider her request and is there a language change that might address the concerns that, been, that have been raised? And maybe this is for Nick rather than you, but whoever is comfortable answering. Sure, I, sure okay, I could. I could try to answer that. So, um, so the city team, team performed a, a windshield survey of some of these properties uh, that were in different uh, stages of construction, and we reviewed their entitlement agreements, and we also uh, reviewed their construction history. Um, uh, we identified projects that can easily be completed with some assistance, and we had to establish some, para some parameters to revive them. So the current building code, the state building code, is clear on expirations, and this ordinance was a balance between moving the building types along and still preserve the authority of the building code. We did not inspect uh, 
we didn't do interior inspections of these projects. We did uh, windshield inspections. So um, we didn't visit the, the specific projects that uh, the representative uh, submitted through public comment, but uh, we can definitely consider those. We can consider those, but it sounds like they're not covered by this ordinance. Well, we, we didn't walk through the project, so we weren't, uh, 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 we didn't answer the, I, the but I, I don't think we can independently you know, verify the, the state of those projects at, with respect to this. I think, um, you know, we, we submitted the, lang the language in the ordinance, understanding, you know, how it would be viewed to be a project that would be near completion. Um, understanding that this comment has raised the specter of projects that might be 70%, as I think the letter said, is that near completion? Maybe not as near completion as we had contemplated with the language that we brought before you, um, but could that be considered? Absolutely. Um, and we would need to, obviously, that would then need to incorporate some changed language if we wanted to be more broad in terms of capturing more projects. Well, I, I guess my my question, or maybe it's a point rather than a question, is why wouldn't we want to capture a project that's 70% completed? Why should the neighborhood live with a project that's not finished? Shouldn't we have language that's broad enough to capture those those projects and get them completed? So I, mean, I, I yeah. don't, yeah, that's not really a question, sorry. <laughs> we'll save that for later. Does that conclude your questions? Thank you. Councilmember Meister, do you have questions? I have one question, and that is, at what point do we, do we think that a project should have to convert to the new codes, right? Because, you know, if it's only 25% complete or whatever, the codes have changed perhaps since, the building codes have changed since, since the time that it was approved. So at what level, you know, at what level of completion should we think about now, I understand Council Member Heilman's point and, and your response in terms of not, you know, if you, haven't, if you haven't looked at it, you don't know for sure it's 70%, right? And I guess, I guess that's going to have to be something that is determined by, by um, your inspectors, right? Um, right. If, if we decide as a group to say 70% 70, 70 completed or whatever. But, um, but my point is building codes have changed over the last few years, where, you know, when, when is it important for us to make sure that the new building codes are incorporated? At what point, if, at what level of completion do you think that we should have to say, look, you need to, you need to incorporate the new building codes? Sure, we did, we did consider that when we were surveying the buildings. Um, and again, uh, the aim was to address or identify the buildings that were near completion um, that can easily be occupied. Um, obviously, there's, there were buildings in different stages of construction, right. and we had to draw a line. So, you know, through the visual survey, we saw that these, these uh, specific buildings that we're trying to uh, address with this ordinance uh, were completed uh, from what we can see from the outside. So all the exterior was finished and needed some work um, in the public right of way, uh, landscaping. Um, and we also looked at the inspection history to see how along, uh, where they left off on their inspection. So right. Right. Um, they were far along where we felt comfortable letting them move along during the, with the code that they were approved under, but there's always some that were not there and they would have to start all over and comply with the current code. So with, that, with, 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 yeah, with the current code. So sorry. that would just lead me to my next question, which is uh, it, the letter that was sent to us about the properties that were not included based on the language that you have now, what is the inspection history on them? Is it far enough along? I mean, there must be a point where you look at a building inspection history and say, okay, this building is, you know, it's gone through this, this, and that, it's far along. This one hasn't gotten to there, it's not so far along. Sure, I, I didn't look specifically into those buildings um, or their, their inspection history. I said I didn't, I didn't look specifically at those two buildings that were uh, brought up by the representative. 
sorry, I would just add that the language, the criteria that are in the ordinance before you are uh, relative to inspections that have been passed. So the past all frame and rough inspections with all interior drywall and exterior finish were completed and inspected. And the con completed construction would still pass these inspections uh, when the renewal is issued. So I think the letter is, is bringing to our attention that this particular property or these properties wouldn't meet that criteria, right? And, and so they were proposing uh, some modifications to that language that, you know, they, they, would, they would know this from the best, that, that would uh, be inclusive of those properties. So, but would you say that, that if there were no inspec inspections on those items, that they aren't far along or that they are far along? I mean, based on what huh. inspections they've had. I mean, I, I think they're representing that it's they're 70 percent complete, but they are not to the level of what's described in the draft ordinance. So, you know, if the council certainly wants to inc go in the direction of incorporating uh, broader language, I think that's something we you know, could help assist with. Yeah. Thank you, Council Member Shine. Do you have questions? Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor Bias, do you have a question? Um, in regards to these properties, uh, specifically how they are applied. What is in the city's toolbox to ensure that they get done? I mean, I think we've all talked up here a bit about uh, big development projects sitting vacant, um, Lake West Hollywood to be one of them, but you know, um, what is in, if we are to approve this tonight, and I see on your three, on the items, uh, they don't do it, comes back, is there financial penalties? I mean, I know there's a bond on one of them, but I mean, I just, I don't know how many times I can be sold magical beans to not have a beanstalk grow. Yeah, so at least for the, um, the projects that are seeking development agreements, um, within the terms of the, of the development agreements, um, I believe that what the city can do is establish milestones whereby if the project you know, doesn't uh, complete a certain milestone by a certain date, then they would be subject to a financial penalty. Um, so, so it's things like that that would help ensure that um, you know, project sites don't remain vacant for an indefinite amount of time, but also you know, when these development agreements have been negotiated between city staff and, and the developer, um, they will come back you know, to the Planning Commission and City Council for, for review and consideration. Will these items be fast-tracked with the second floor uh, to get them done? Specifically, you know, uh, I see some deadlines put in place here. I get emails every day saying things are delayed. They get a comment from one person, a comment from another person who just started. I mean, what type of priority will the second floor put on these projects, these major development projects, so we can, you know, move them quickly? Because, I mean, we've been, the community has been waiting on several of them for many years. I would just say in that respect, the, the ordinance under 3B, um, you know, it seems like a, a bit of time that's allowed for, but it's really quite short. Yeah. Um, you know, in terms of the amount of time to uh, begin the negotiation or, you know, wrap up the negotiation process with the development agreement and bring it forward through the public process. So there, there really isn't any time to, to waste in, in terms of, this is a fairly expeditious process, I would say, that we've laid out in terms of the time frames to be able to bring these items forward. Um, and and that, that's how we, I mean, I think that's why we arrived at this six month extension. Um, we felt like that was what was needed to be able to complete this process. And it's up to six months. It's not saying it's gonna take six months, right? Yes. Correct. Great. I don't have any council, Vice Mayor Byers. Thank you. Um, just one question came to mind. I had understood this about getting projects that were closer nearing to the finish line over the finish line. The public comment letter we received indicated there may be a different tier of issues um, that are out there. Do we have a sense of how many other projects may be a part of that tier? I can't imagine that it's just this one. I, I don't think we do at this point. We have a sense of approximately how many projects might be eligible using the criteria that that are laid out in the ordinance before you. And I think it's, um, and Ben could speak to this, I think it's 10 projects that we flagged, um, about 10 projects representing about- Close to 30. Uh, close to 30 housing units okay. across those 10 projects. Um, so that's the universe that would be captured in terms of what, what would be captured with a new threshold. Um, we, we don't have that um, 
information yeah. for you right now. Okay. Thank you. And I would just add that it's something that we could look at and come back later. Uh, if you were to approve this tonight um, and allow us to move forward with the projects that are substantially complete, then we could look at those other projects in that next tier and bring back a separate ordinance. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to now receive public comment on the item. Um, any persons wishing to speak may speak on a maximum of two minutes. Um, Madam City Clerk, how many do we have in chambers for both items? Six speakers. Are there any on Zoom? Great. We'll go to in chambers, please. And our first uh, speaker is Oliver Gabay to be followed by uh, DJ Moore. City Council members. I work with uh, Systems LP. And we're working on the Melrose Triangle project. My name's Oliver Gabay. Uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity for letting us apply for this DA. I, it was made known to me later today that there was a revision that essentially what was just repeated here that we couldn't uh, pull a permit in the midst of negotiating the DA, which I can understand. Um, but just sitting here uh, two of the three goals that were mentioned was getting the project built in a timely manner and making sure that the project isn't vacant. The confusion I have is that if we're able to pull a permit in the midst of the DA, which shouldn't cancel the, any timelines or DAs or the agreement at all, but it would be surprising to me to not allow the project to be built or start construction so that something can be built as quickly as possible. I can only speak for our project, uh, but we're in the, we're about to submit for the fifth round of comments on our plans. And I mean, the city has been working diligently and quickly on our, part, on our behalf to get us comments back. So I would imagine that this would be the last round before approvals. Obviously we'll be negotiating the DA, but to be able to pull that permit would help I mean, everyone, because if we're able to pull that permit within the next two months, there's no reason to keep this project sitting vacant for the next four. Um, other than that, I mean, maybe there is a, a tweak we can make here. My, my quickest recommendation would be the project is in two phases. One is subterranean, one is above grade. So maybe to, allow, to apply the not pulling a permit for, uh, for, a, for a project under negotiation and a development agreement to be applied to anything above grade. So that way at least subterranean can happen and the lake, as you call it, can be filled. Thank you again. Thank you. Lovingly referred to. Um, next up, we have DJ Moore uh, to, follow by, to be followed by John Coate. Good evening, Mayor Erickson, council members, DJ Moore of Latham and Watkins. On behalf of one of the reasons the ordinance is before you this evening, uh, 8920 Sunset Boulevard, LLC. Uh, we're here tonight in support of staff's recommendation, but I just wanted to spend a moment uh, on the context of our request, which includes a development agreement application that we filed back in November of 2023. Um, as approved, the 8920 Sunset Project would be a ground up nine story commercial building with a private membership club, creative office space, retail and restaurant uses with outdoor dining along Sunset. The project includes a number of significant public benefits, including arts funding for the city, a public art gallery, and a music rehearsal space. 8920 earned the support of numerous community groups and residents and is one of the very few projects in the city that was directly endorsed by the voters who in 2019 rejected a referendum petition challenging the city's project approvals. Our clients remain committed to developing the Gensler design project, but like many other developments across the region, as staff noted, the project has been delayed due to COVID-19 and the resulting financial markets that have made financing challenging. Accordingly, we filed the development agreement application last year to give us additional time to build and city staff has not yet had sufficient time to negotiate that agreement with our clients. So we are asking the council to approve the proposed ordinance and allow up to six months for the so the terms of that agreement can be reached. We've spoken to a number of stakeholders and recognize that site activation is an important benefit that they will want to see in any agreement that gets brought back to council. 
To that end, we're already working with the Chamber and the Sunset Bid on a potential music and arts residency at the site that could come to fruition this fall. We intend to work out site activation and other details with staff and are requesting that you approve this ordinance to give us the time necessary to do that. Thank you, we're here to answer any questions you may have. We appreciate your consideration. Thank you so much, DJ. John Cote to be followed by Kimberly Winnick. Good evening, Mayor, Councilman. I've um, been a uh, resident of Hawaii for 45 years. I'm uh, the uh, manager of um, the building directly behind the 8920 uh, building. They were gracious enough to come Can to us. Can you speak into the mic? All right, I'm sorry. They, they were gracious enough to accommodate us and make arrangements for uh, compensating us for the inconvenience, but then we had COVID. So it's a major, it's a major eyesore right now to have that building there. And it's, I believe it's a magnet for homeless and maybe uh, rats or whatever. Um, but uh, I concur that maybe the six months would, if, if what's required for them, just to get it going and uh, for, for, the, for somebody from their staff to keep us in the loop because all we know is we just have that building there and uh, it's in, it's, uh, it impacts our residents. I'm the manager of the building impacts the residents. So whatever happens to that building is a major impact on our residents. So please, whatever is needed to get it done, get it done. If they need the six months, give it six months. And also, I just want to thank you for you concurring with the, with the extension of the year that was the previous. Thank you for making it a year because we don't need, we don't need uh, uh, 30 day people to change the whole community. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. Kimberly Winnick to be followed by Alyssa Pastor. Kimberly Winnick, Huntley Drive, West Hollywood. As you all know, I've lived in West Hollywood since 1985. I've lot, watched a lot of development. I've watched some incredibly slow development. I think that Council Member Meister made an excellent point about um, whether projects that have been delayed need to be upgraded. I would point to what was done on Melrose as an example of how older project design maybe isn't suitable anymore. We've got all this blank sidewalk because it was designed 10 years ago. You know, we're now looking at the Triangle Project and they have worked really well with the neighborhood. But it's been a long time. Maybe those permits need to be double checked. Maybe the, um, the design needs to be reconsidered in light of current code. And development agreements are important, but in the past, they haven't necessarily been designed to be as beneficial to the community as they could be. And so as you're allowing more time to negotiate development agreements, uh, do use that as a carrot and stick. And do use that to come up with good things for the community in addition to simply getting the projects done. Additionally, please try to be more attentive to actually enforcing permit timelines. We've had some projects that, honest to goodness, have gone for a decade. And, you know, somebody comes in once every six months and has a worker there for a day and they get an extension. And I could be referring to the building at the corner of Norwich and Melrose. And houses the same thing. And I watch what happens inside of these properties when they aren't being completed. Extra attention has to be paid to whether or not they can be <laughs> completed without first being taken partly back down. Thank you so Thank much, you. Kimberly. Alyssa Pastor to be followed by Yossi Atia. Uh, good evening, Mayor Erickson and council members. Um, I'm Elisa Pastor from Rand Pastor Nelson. I'm here on behalf of Stanley Hills. Um, so Stanley Hills has control of 28 units. 
Um, and one of those projects is um, seven units, which is on Fairfax, and that will complies with the ordinance as written. We've also got 21 units, including three very low income units on Ogden, and that is what we're requesting today for the language to be changed. Um, Council Member Meister, I think you asked a good question, which is, well, where do we draw the line? And where we're sort of suggesting you draw the line is when you have framing done, you have um, one roof nail inspection done, um, and one either mechanical, electrical, or plumbing inspection done. My client, Yossi, who will get up after me, is a very experienced contractor, and so he can answer your more technical questions about what happens during the process. But what he's told me is that the way that it's written now, it's really very much at the end of construction because many of those inspections don't happen until you already have the framing up, you have all the MEP in and all of these things, and so you've spent all of this money. But where we're suggesting um, you draw the line is also a place where you're substantially done. I sent you the pictures. So once the framing is up and it's over the basement, right, significant structural changes may need to be done if they had to go back. So in the case of Ogden, if they needed to go back, first of all, he would walk away. And so that would be 21 housing units the city would effectively then lose because the lender would then take it back and is, quite honestly, I'm not, the lender's not here, but the lender's not here, which is also, you know, a question. Um, and so, the neighbors really want this to get done. We've worked very cooperatively with them. There's also a letter from our architect um, that was just submitted. Um, and we're happy to answer any questions. As I said, he can answer some more technical. And Alyssa, correct me if I'm wrong, um, those properties in Ogden were owned by FMB development, which is the next agenda item we'll be talking about and would remain vacant, correct? Correct. If this didn't go through? That's correct. Okay. Well, and I mean, we would just walk away. Yeah, so it's unclear, same, what, would, unclear what would happen yeah, with them. But he bought two properties from uh, FMB development, which has lots of comments from this council. Correct. Thank you. Um, uh, Yossi Atia to be followed by our last speaker, Nick Royville. Hi. Hi. Good evening, everybody. Just to correct the answer, we bought it from the lender, not from FMB. Got it. So we're taking control of the land from the lender. And the reason I want to talk is just to clarify something about the construction. The point that they make, they have stucco and drywall inside. That means the building's almost done. The problem with that is, in order to get to drywall, you got to move at a two months period almost, so three months between you finish framing the building, you put the window, you put the stucco. In the meantime, you got to work HVAC, electrical, plumbing. And until you finish all of those inspections, you cannot get the drywall. So even though that it looks the dry will come right after framing, I will urge you guys, if you want to change and finish all the buildings that are built, there's 10 of them. I can give you all the addresses. I, right now, in control of four, and there is six of them that I can actually get engaged and control, but I wanted to have an answer if those buildings can be finished or not. And if we can finish them, everybody's eager to finish them, and we're going to rent them. So the point is, if you finish framing of the building, if you go in bring it to the new code, we can dance around that. But what it means is, is debt. You got to demo the building, take it down to the ground, and maybe you can save the basement, but that's not even true in some cases. So when we're making those decisions, we got to realize on the one that I'm dealing with on Ogden and on Fairfax, we can finish them before the end of the year. And if you want to impose something on the developer, put a fine if you don't find, finish it in time. Give people a year to finish the building. You don't finish it. We're going to start charge you. That's all I got. Thanks. Thank you so much, Yossi. Nick Royball is our last speaker in chambers, and I believe we have Genevieve Morel on Zoom. Thanks. So, well, Mayor Erickson, I lied. I'm sorry. I told you I wasn't going to speak tonight, <laughs> but I, I know. <laughs> I was being good. I don't like being overexposed. But this, uh, Nick Royball, who lives on Ogden, is a renter. You know, as I sit in this chamber and listen to developers say, trust us, right, Nick? The developers are saying, trust us, trust us, please, city. And what I heard was developers usually, <laughs> they're tricky. 
Uh, they, know very, they know what they're doing. Using the state, knowing you have to incorporate housing, and holding that over you, right? You have a housing element. So if you don't buy what they're asking you to buy, they're saying, oh, now you're against you know, your housing element. But in terms of this ordinance council, what mechanisms and enforcements are in this to hold them accountable? Because I know for people living on Ogden, south of Santa Monica Boulevard, ain't none of us trust any of them. We don't. I don't trust a single word that any of them have said up here. And I know I'm not alone in that. The little person has no say against big, large developers. So my ask to you is in these ordinances, which I liked how Kimberly Winnick mentioned, where do, how do we fit into these ordinances? The common person in WeHo. How do we? That's my question. That's my ask. Because I'm hearing, let's trust the developer, but who trusts the average citizen in this community? Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. We'll move on to Zoom. Our next speaker is Jen. Go ahead, Jen. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council members, Genevieve Morrill, President and CEO for the West Hollywood Chamber of Commerce, and I also serve as the bid manager for the Sunset Strip Business Improvement District. We're here to support the six-month extension. You know, this developer has actually been in communication and connection with the community, even from across the pond, and a lot has transpired since their entitlement was granted. And so we've been working with the owners in London to provide a space for exhibits on Sunset Strip with partnerships. And we hope it's to kind of create an artist salon, and we are working with Word uh, Song Art House to beautify and activate the site. With artwork inspired by the doors in October, and I also know that they've been working with Milo from the um, Arts and Cultural Affairs Commission on ideas for activation and creating sort of an artist hub. We also did a walkthrough, and we'll be updating the outdated ADA requirements, and we're working with Edison to repower the site. Our hope is to create a more pedestrian activation on the strip and have community benefits. So in the meantime, as the developer gets those designs together and the framing, as we say, and we can help create art on the strip and create more of a community space. It's the closing weekend of the James Brown exhibit right next to, the door, right next to that building at 8912 Sunset in that vacant space. So we were really open, we're really trying to open up and get this whole block back to life on the strip. So please join us in that support. I hope that um, you will support tonight's item. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Morrell. That concludes public comments. I'm gonna now close the public testimony portion of the public hearing and move on to council deliberations. Councilmember Heilman, may I ask you to start? Sure, thank you. And thank you to everyone who came out to speak tonight. Um, we have two items that we combined. The first item is time limit for discretionary permits for uh, primarily two bigger developments that are seeking a development agreement. Those development agreements would be where we would negotiate um, the specific timelines and penalties in the event that the developers do not move forward with um, the construction. And I'm supportive of this. I think it is important that we allow these projects to at least negotiate a development agreement. But I'm going to be looking very carefully at those development agreements to make sure that there are, in, spe in fact, specific benchmarks. And if they don't comply with those benchmarks, that the city is paid a penalty and that the city gets a community benefit from the uh, developments. I did not support the what is formally <laughs> known as the Arts Club project. I didn't support it. I didn't think the height was necessary, but the council did approve it. And if we are going forward with that, we need to make sure that the Arts Club is actually going to locate themselves in that property or some 
of facility of comparable quality is going to be located and we also need to take into account the fact that the longer the delay is the longer the city is not getting the income that those projects should be generating for the community so i do like the idea of short term um, uh, activate, activation on the strip, that area is a terrible dead zone, uh, but I'm not gonna, uh, if that development co agreement comes back and it's not really in the community or the city's favor, I'm not gonna support approving that development agreement. I would also suggest that the developers have very skilled and uh, capable individuals um, who do these kind of agreements all the time Maybe it's uh, something where the city wants to bring in some outside consultants to help us with those negotiations. I'm not knocking the skills of our city attorney uh, or our staff, but having some additional eyes uh, and input from outside experts might help our negotiating position. On 3C, I am certainly supportive of this. We have some projects that the previous developer filed for bankruptcy and they're in sort of uh, this interim <laughs> stage where they're half built, half not built. Uh, I want those to be completed and I want that housing to become available. Uh, Yossi, who spoke, uh, is not the person who created the problem. He's here trying to fix the problem that a previous developer created. I would like that ordinance to be as broad as possible to capture all of the residential uh, projects that are in this uh, sort of half-built stage. Uh, I would be supportive of expanding what we have tonight. And if we are unable to do it, uh, maybe we should ask <clears throat> the city manager to quickly come back with some revised language. But I'm just worried that we're going to lose the, um, the interest of somebody who's prepared to take over a project if the language is broad enough. Um, in terms of what the community gets out of this, the community gets these projects completed rather than sitting there half constructed. So that's what I think we want to accomplish as much as possible. I don't know what that specific language is. Perhaps Lauren has some ideas. I know Alyssa came forward with some ideas. Uh, maybe you can look at that while uh, the rest of the council is commenting. Thank Those you. are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to go left to right, Vice Mayor Byers. Thank you, Mayor. I, too, am generally supportive of both of these items. Um, I, I know we are have long awaited completion on our number of projects, and we really want to get things moving forward. Um, I just lacking the data that we have about the potential number of projects that are in this sort of different tier would be more supportive of bringing something back as soon as possible um, to ensure that we're, you know, Building codes and uh, are there for a reason. It's about safety. It's about building efficiency. And just without the lack, with the lack of data to really know how many more would be exposed to that, for me, it's a capacity challenge. Is this ordinance one size fits all becoming too cumbersome to really navigate the thing that it was intended to do tonight? Um, so that's the concern I have. But I trust staff to be able to negotiate those things. So if our city attorney gives us language or we can work out language tonight that creates a broader ordinance, as Councilmember Heilman suggested, I too would be in favor. The ultimate goal I have is making sure that things are on track, that we're not losing the investment that we have made in this community, and that we are getting these projects over the finish line fast, um, and that the community is getting the best out of that. Um, so that's sort of where I'm at in general, and we'll see what we get. Sounds good. Councilmember Meister? So I'll start with this 3C first. Um, I think that um, I agree that we need to expand the language to include uh, as many properties as we can as long as they are close, as long as they uh, have the framing done and that um, uh, and if, if it was obvious that any changes we made would cause them to have to 
demolish what they have done, obviously that's not a good thing because we don't want to have to start from scratch. So I'm definitely open to that. And then uh, Yossi gave us, uh, you know, the Yossi challenge, which is that he's going to finish this, these, these projects by the end of the year. So I would hold Yossi's feet to the fire on that. And I also liked his idea about penalties if he's not done by certain times. So to me, I think that there needs to be a substantial bond up front. Uh, there have to be very, very specific milestones in a very specific and tight time frame. Um, and also just thinking about the future, we, for the future, we just need a new system of checking financing. I, I just have a, a feeling that the same letter was given on every project saying this is, you know, we, you know, we have the financing for this um, by the previous, uh, uh, people who uh, had these properties, and so my concern is that we have to we have to get uh, you know more st stringent about checking financing to make sure that that when somebody starts um, buying up uh, you know 20 properties that they actually do have the the uh, financing to 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 do what they say they're going to do. But I am so I am open to. Um, to expanding that language, whether it is um, that we approve this ordinance today and we come back at the next meeting or whatever with uh, for this, the other tier. But as long as the, it is, in fact, that the other tier uh, w would be better off moving forward than it would be going backwards, right? So, um, and then regarding the time limit extension uh, for um, discretionary permits and entitlements seeking development agreements, um, I would suggest, and actually I would suggest this even for the, for the uh, other, is uh, while, you're, while you're working on development agreements, let's have some neighborhood meetings. Let's get the neighborhoods up to date on what's going on. Um, I think that these developers uh, owe it to the neighborhood to, um, to talk to them and, to, and for them to know what's going on. Um, again, I think that if there's gonna be a development agreement there should be money up front. I mean, there should just be money up front. Show us the money. Because if you don't have the financing, if you don't have enough money to put towards the development agreement, then I don't trust that you're gonna have the money after, after the fact. Um, again, I think that we have to have very, very specific milestones in a very specific and tight time frame. Um, and um, I think that we should have some system for both uh, types of having some kind of penalty if if milestones are not met. Um, and then I just want to uh, also just say that I know that the public benefits, uh, we never really finished the policy and it's all been a, a test and a pilot, but to me, if we're going to development agreements now, um, and I know that the, um, the uh, Arts Club was a project that um, that it was a public benefits uh, project. Uh, we we need to just it, let's go with what you know what has more teeth, and if that's a development agreement, then then I think that's how we should go from as we move forward. We tried the public benefits. It, either way, we're getting public benefits, right? So. Um, the development agreement is what allows us to get public benefits apart from the project itself. Right, but, but the thing is that we didn't have development agreements that had to do with uh, timing. And that's, and that's the difference for us to really think realistically about how things are gonna be done. Yeah. So uh, I, I agree, but I, th I think the DA again has, has, more, has more teeth and has more possibilities uh, in terms of uh, the things that are, are, as we see, stopping, stopping these things from happening. Um, so those, those are my thoughts on it. Um, I think that um, it's, it's very depressing to see uh, the one developer come back after, you know, I, I, I moved into West Hollywood West in 1998 and started going to meetings about uh, the Melrose Triangle in 2000. And the only thing that's held up that project is the developer. And the next time anyone blames the residents for that kind of thing, they're gonna to have to talk to me about it. Thank you. Councilmember Shine. 
Thank you. Um, so Arts Club, um, Melrose Triangle, both projects supported um, by uh, the residents in the area and the residents really want these built. So um, I understand COVID, I understand all of the um, unforeseen results of COVID. Um, I also uh, know that our city and our residents don't understand um, having a large uh, empty lot. So um, I'm in uh, support of uh, the development agreement um, and uh, for 3A, 3B um, and prioritizing timing is going to be essential. And I mean strict timing, milestones, um, absolutely bonds, uh, amazing public benefits to make up for um, having such a long time of just an um, empty space. Um, is gonna be really important. Arts Club, I also understand that there were um, changes that needed to be made that were sort of out of the control of the, uh, the um, applicant. Um, and I do, I do believe that they're going to move forward and um, uh, if, this was, if these were things that the residents were against, this hearing would be much longer, so please, let's get these moving, okay? Um, as far as the other item, um, I think it's a, it's a good way of um, expanding it to include more uh, properties so they can get built, but with, the, um, uh, with that test that uh, Councilmember Meister really articulated well, um, of uh, the near completion with the, I like your caveat of, if it's not gonna happen, let's not do that. So um, taking those nuances into account will be important. So um, that's where I am on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, my colleagues. Um, uh, I'll start with item 3C. Um, I agree with what all's been said, the Yossi way. So get started now, Yossi. Um, but I think that uh, in terms of this item, I too would like it to be as broad as possible. Um, as the only member on the council that lives on the east side, uh, it's really important. I do walk by this area a lot. I actually picked up Girl Scout cookies from my friend that lives by there. It's another story. But we were talking about how this issue does plague our community, and we do need to create that housing. And I agree with what's been said. So um, I'm actually in favor of the submitted language. I understand understand the uh, back and forth with um, our amazing planning staff, but I do think that that is broadly encompassing of what I think would catch into these uh, specific um, properties. So that would be amending section 106.5.4.1 to be read as completed construction as successfully passed, one roof nail inspection, one mechanical, electrical, or plumbing inspection, and windows and stucco have been installed and the completed construction would still pass these inspections when the renewal is issued. Uh, City Attorney Langer. Um, I think staff may also have some language yeah. that accomplishes broadening the language, but in a, a way that they might feel a little more comfortable Sounds with. Sounds good. So do you want to suggest some language for item 3C? Yes, thank you. Um, so we would suggest uh, replacing uh, par subparagraph C um, with the following. Completed construction has successfully passed all framing inspections, and more than 50% of rough trade interior drywall and exterior finishes are completed and inspected, and the completed construction would still pass these inspections when the renewal is issued. So that's um, a little bit different than what was presented in the letter. I think we feel that it would accomplish the same. I can read it again if it's helpful. Um, so completed construction has successfully passed all framing inspections, and more than 50% of rough trade, interior drywall, and exterior finishes are completed and inspected, and the completed construction would still pass these inspections when the renewal is issued. So it sounds like there might, I'm looking at uh, Alyssa right there, and so I did, we did 
close the public testimony portion, but we can, it's not we really, can we can reopen it. So I'm gonna reopen the public testimony period. Um, uh, before we do that, would it be beneficial for planning staff and city attorney Langer and Alyssa to talk real quick and then we can come back with language in a way. I feel like everyone's inching closer to each other and it might serve our best interests on item 3C. Is that okay? Yeah, maybe maybe take a recess. Yeah. And maybe we can do 3B yes. first yeah, and then complete good. that and that would give some time for you to digest and for Alyssa to digest and then we can take a break and come back to 3C. Um, while you're looking at uh, our 3C, uh, there's some 3B. language in that that I was a little bit confused on. It specifies that the applicant pays a fee equal to one half amount required for a new permit. That's in there. And then in section G, it specifies all approved electrical, plumbing, mechanical, and other issued permits shall be extended concurrently when fees equal to one half the original permit fee are paid. Is that one half of the building permit that you were referencing previously, or is that one half of the electrical, plumbing, mechanical, and other permit fees? Sure, thank you, uh, Councilman Hallman. I'll clarify that. So mechanical, all the trade permits are issued separately from the main building permit. So the intent was these buildings that are almost complete, instead of paying the entire new fees for a permit, it was just 50% because those fees cover the inspections and the goal was to target these uh, nearly complete projects so it wouldn't need as many uh, inspections as a brand new development. So there's where the 50% came from. And same thing, uh, same thought followed with uh, the trades and any um, uh, deferred submittals that uh, we get for these permits. So, so section G should actually be clarified that we're talking about one half of the original permit fee for electrical, plumbing, mechanical, et cetera, in sure. addition to one half of the building fee. We can clarify that, yes. Okay. Uh, that was the intention. That's the correct? intention. It's okay. Before we break here, um, I just wanted to suggest, and I, if my colleagues are open to this, that during this process and beyond, there should be security, 24-7 security at these sites, at this, because they're having a lot of issues, the neighbors are having a lot of issues at these sites. Um, so if they're not secure, they need to be secured. I, I agree. So why don't we move on to 3B? It sounds like that one, um, from what I understood and wrote down, uh, we wanted to uh, look at a bond, money up front. Yep. Timing. I, I think that's what would be negotiated in the, DA, in right? the development yeah, agreement. Yeah, that, okay. that was just yes. my Okay, yes. understood. So that was just true. Okay, yeah. understood. Thank you. All right. So. Um, I would move to introduce yeah. that item, uh, that ordinance on first reading for 3B Second. with Second. the direction that we've given about being really tough on the development agreement. We have a motion and a second, second. by Council Member Shine. Um, I have no further discussion on this. Do any of my colleagues? You're good? I just keep looking at you. Okay, sounds good. All right, a voice vote, please. Council Member Heilman? Aye. Council Member Meister? Aye. Councilmember Schein? Aye. Vice Mayor Byers? Aye. Mayor Erickson? Aye. 3B passes, and we're going to take a quick five minute break. Uh, the public hearing is still open ish. So council members won't Don't talk, talk to each other, but the public you all but staff talk can and we'll be convene back in to a talk about minutes. some options. Do we want to take a 10 minute break Why so that way we, we can just keep going? Now. Yeah, we're just going to take a break. We're going to take a 10 minute break, come back, and then we're going to just keep going through. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member.
Don't go too far, Councilmember Heilman. All right. <clears throat> Thank you so much, everyone. We're going to call the meeting back to order. All right. I'm going to turn it over to City Attorney Langer to talk about the proposed language, and then we can move forward. Yeah, I actually think planning staff is going to pull up their computer so we can sure. all, everyone in the room can see the language that has changed. It'll be Wonderful. highlighted in yellow. And I can read it and then we'll show Sounds it. Sounds good. <laughs> so uh, while, while we are... I said I emailed it. Well, while we are waiting for it to show up on the screen, I'll just read it um, to get get it here introduced. Um, so this is uh, subparagraph C would be modified to read okay. uh, as follows. Construction has successfully completed framing, comma, and more than 50% of rough trade and exterior finishes are completed and inspected, comma, and the completed construction would still pass these inspections when the renewal is issued. Thank you. And we'll show that on the screen. We have a couple of other um, changes to the other subparagraphs in uh, uh, response to uh, Councilmember Heilman's uh, comment about uh, the permit fees. There we go. Great. So maybe just scroll down just a little bit so we can see G as well. Okay. Or maybe I guess we can't see it all on one screen. So go back up. So there we go. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right. Now you can hopefully see it all. I'm prepared to move the item both as um, um, an urgency ordinance as well as a regular ordinance with the changes that staff has, has just outlined. I'll second. Sounds good. We have a motion and a second by Councilmember Heilman and Councilmember Meister. No other discussion. City Clerk, let's take a vote. Thank you. And just to clarify, this is uh, section three. Um, 106.5.4.1 renewal and expired permits. Councilmember Heilman. Yes. Councilmember <clears throat> Meister. Yes. Councilmember Schein. Yes. Vice Mayor Byers. Yes. Mayor Erickson. Yes. Thank you. And Thank you so much. I just say one thing because this is an amendment to the building code, there's actually another public hearing on this on the second reading next time, which will happen on April 1st. But I think we've worked out all the language changes. Sounds good. We'll see you back April 1st. Moving forward, thank you very much, staff, for uh, all of your hard work, and thank you to the members of the public that spoke and for your attention to this. We're going to move on to item 4A, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of West Hollywood amending chapters 9.60, public nuisances, 9.64, vacant properties, and 9.70, construction management of the West Hollywood Municipal Code to enhance security and properties and providing an update on the West Hollywood Vacant Property Program. Um, staff representatives, once you sit down, um, please do a staff report, and then we'll go to questions. And are there I, people on Zoom? No, Mayor. And there's just two public commenters in person? Thank you. Good, good evening, Mayor Erickson, Vice Mayor Byers, and members of the City Council. My name is Vito Adamitis. I'm the Neighborhood and Business Safety Manager for the City. I'm joined here tonight to my left by Community Safety Director Danny Rivas and Code Enforcement Supervisor Eugene Alper. The item before you tonight is comprised of three parts. So if I understood correctly, I think the Council wanted the full report for this item. Do you want what? a full report or an abbreviated one? Abbreviated, please. An abbreviated one. Okay, I will go to abbreviated uh, version. So the item before you tonight is comprised of three parts. The first item is the introduction in, of the first reading for the ordinance number 24-next in line that would amend the public nuisances, vacant properties, and construction management chapters of the West Hollywood Municipal Code 
to enhance existing regulations and security regarding vacant properties. Item number two of the three would be to receive an update on the West Hollywood Vacant Property Program. And the last item, item three, is a recommendation for the City Council to direct staff to work with the City Attorney's Office to explore amending the City's Municipal Code to establish alternate mechanisms to authorize and re or require the demolition for problematic or failed vacant property buildings based on public safety impacts. In the staff report, you have um, the information regarding the update regarding the 53 vacant property uh, code enforcement cases that are listed there. As shown in the report, 34 of those are at the stable classification, five are at risk, and 14 are problematic. I'd like to just uh, go directly to the proposed ordinance amendments before you. With regard to the proposed ordinance amendments, staff is recommending amendments to the definitions in the public nuisance and vacant property ordinances to provide updates to position titles due to changes made in the organization. Proposed revisions are also being made within the vacant property ordinance to allow the city to order security on vacant properties assigned an at-risk classification and to address the removal and security of portable restrooms. Lastly, with regard to proposed amendments, operating requirements within the construction management ordinance are also being revised to include the same language used in the vacant property ordinance related to the ordering of on-site security on a 24-7 basis. In addition, language is being proposed to address the security of portable restrooms on a construction site and similar updates to definitions to mirror those being proposed in the public nuisance and vacant property ordinance. It's important to point out that the ordering of on-site security for current construction uh, projects is important part of this change. Finally, staff is asking for the city council to direct staff to work with the city attorney's office to explore amending the city's municipal code to make it possible for problematic or failed vacant buildings that are currently in the development and planning process to be issued demolition permits at the discretion of the city manager or designee. This request for direction comes from feedback and complaints received from some members of the community, community calling for what would allow the demolition of properties based on trespassing activity the lack of maintenance of the property, or the number of complaints to the Sheriff's Department or to City Code Enforcement. However, there are also concerns that the demolition of properties with this new approach may encourage property owners not to take requisite actions to safeguard their properties in the hopes of forcing the city to require the demolition of these properties. And by doing so, could potentially lead to the demolition of housing that could otherwise be converted back for use on the long-term housing market. For this reason, careful and further review of this item is needed with the city attorney's office in order for staff to be able to return to the city council at a future date with consideration of suitable language in this regard. This concludes my staff report. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilmember Meister, do you have questions? Uh, all right, I'll, have, I'll, I'll find it. Okay. So uh, this is, I mean, you brought up the concern about the fact that if you demolish something, then there's no potential for that housing if something doesn't happen and they, and, and uh, you know, someone goes bankrupt or whatever. Um, why doesn't this item include exploring alternate mechanisms to keeping properties rented? Uh, 
Thank you, Councilmember Meister, um, Danny Rivas, Director of Community Safety for the City. Um, so that is definitely something that we will be um, exploring with uh, community development and um, also looking at other departments um, to kind of look at um, alternative mechanisms. Um, it's simply just asking the council to direct staff to look into the feasibility of it, um, but we can definitely incorporate that input and feedback as we're discussing it internally. And, and if it makes sense, um, you know, looking at all those different options, then that's definitely something we could do. We've allowed a number of properties to demolish. What have, on what basis have we allowed that then, if, it, if not for public safety reasons? So we, we actually um, have not, from, um, from that perspective, we've uh, utilized what's currently in the zoning ordinance as it speaks now and what's in place. And what that calls out is for eminent um, safety hazards um, to be dealt by the, the building official. And so the interpretation that city staff has been utilizing consistently is really looking at the structural integrity uh, of a vacant property structure. And so if it rises to a situation where the building official determines that it's, uh, it could be red tagged, um, then that's what would give us that capability in terms of making a determination of ordering the demolition. Um, but if the st structural integrity of a structure is not compromised um, and, and it's in place, um, yet we're still receiving calls for service, um, you know, resources are obviously being exhausted, both from our West Hollywood Sheriff Station, right, our code enforcement personnel, et cetera, then those are the alternative uh, criteria, if you will, that we would be kind of looking at exploring to see the feasibility of whether or not that's something that we could potentially uh, make a decision on. Um, this question might be for planning, but how, do we have anything in our codes that that requires a, a certain timing from the point of demolition to the to when construction begins? Um, I'll I'll defer to um, community development. Staff. I mean, because look at for example the Melrose Triangle, which you know demolished all of those buildings that were actually you know, people were renting. I mean, there were tenants in those, in those buildings. Um, and then because, because they got rid of everybody uh, and then, then uh, transients did get in and there was no security and then there was a fire and then they were allowed to demolish. And 15 years later, here we are. Um, a, another example is on, on my block. Uh, Somebody passed away. Um, he was a longtime member of this community. Uh, John Holland will remember Marty Strudler. Um, they left it empty, vacated, didn't bother to rent it out or whatever, left it vacated for, for a couple of years. Transients got in. There was no fire, there was no nothing. They were allowed to demolish. The place is gone. And now they, they haven't come back. So I guess my bigger concern is this whole idea of giving that out of, of um, I don't want to make my comments yet, but so my question is, is, can we add a requirement of, you know, if you don't, you have to have a begin construction and not just one hammer a week uh, after you demolish. Can that be, can that be added to this, to this uh, if we give the direction to do so? You found a question or two. Yeah, Congrats. Uh, Councilmember Hyman, do you have any questions? No, I, I'm supportive and I appreciate it that you took uh, the time to uh, document how many vacant <coughs> properties there are and how many are actually stable. Most of them are stable. We're doing questions. Um, there were only oh, five. Councilmember Hyman, we're only separate. doing questions. We have yeah. public comment. Okay. So oh. <laughs> I. Thank you. He, he took me for, I thought that was a long-winded question, but nevertheless, it's great. Yeah. Council Member Shine, do you have questions? Nope. Vice Mayor Byers. Um, so my questions, uh, question, I think, um, lie in pages, um, well, three, four, five, uh, six, and seven of the staff report. Um, so I guess, one, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm more concerned about the number of items that are in plan check. And so what we have here 
is that we have items that are in plan check and they're waiting, but it's a vacant property. And so to, I think, one of my colleagues' points, it's not being utilized for housing, probably. You know, it's, my, it's vacant. Um, and we are the holdup. So why is that? Considering vacant properties are such a huge issue for our city at the moment. Mayor Erickson, so the buildings that are in plan check, um, so the way the plan check process works is, uh, you know, there's multiple uh, city divisions and county agencies that are reviewing the projects to comply with their design standards. So the applicant is working with city staff through their plan check. Um, they're also working with LA County Fire um, when applicable with the health department. So. Um, when we review a project, give the, the applicants back corrections, um, the design team is addressing those corrections. So sometimes we'll get submittals in a few weeks and sometimes it'll be a few months. So it, it really depends on how quickly the design team gets their corrections back to the city for us to uh, re-review their projects. Um, currently we do have a uh, track system where we place projects depending on the scope of work. Um, like for example, a single family dwelling would go under review for like 15 business days. So we're pretty good at meeting um, that timeline. And once that review is completed, we give the corrections back to the applicant or the design team. So it's really up to the design team to quickly or however they're uh, reviewing their drawings to get back to us as quickly as possible. And the design team is the applicant. It's well, yes, the it's applicant. It's not us. It's not the city. It, it's the applicant. Just well, I just want to be clear on terminology. The architects, yes. So, is there any expedited process for? I understand, like number 11, 1200 block of Larrabee, residential in plan check stable. That seems like normal processes. It seems like it's going forward. But then, number seven, 400 block of Westmount, residential in plan check problematic. That. Do you all expedite those types of permits and get it done faster? I mean, especially if it's a problematic house, because that means there's probably nuisance complaints, I mean, no, uh, everything else, or is there no process for that? We, we do work with applicants, um, and we do, and, and multiple city staff, to, uh, staff will meet with applicants to go over their comments, to answer any questions. So in that sense, yes, we do help move those projects along by meeting with the applicants to answer their questions. Great. Um, one question regarding comments that you give out, and I think I know the answer already, but I'll ask is, so let's say number eight, I'm just throwing these out, no particular reason, um, 8,700 block of Melrose, commercial, well, don't use that one because it's not on plan check, but let's go to one that's at risk. Um, number six, so Susan, I'm just throwing out a name, I don't know if that's a city staffer, but like Susan's looking at it, she gives comments, and then do they go right back, and then does someone else give more comments? Because that's what I hear from people about the second floor, it's, you know, they've been working with, I'm just gonna pick on the name Susan, I don't know why, but Susan for months, and then, you know, Paul comes in, and Paul has a whole new set of corrections, and then it's, you know, we get into this rigmarole of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then the property's problematic or at risk. Can we, or is there a process in which the city can designate that the same person, unless they leave, of course, sticks with the project so it can be moved along faster? Or how do we mitigate or streamline these processes for the second floor or for building and safety or planning to move these, these vacant properties done sooner so not only do we get the housing but we also solve the public safety aspect of it, causing time for code and sheriffs and everything else. Sure, we're currently looking at streamlining our systems okay. um, and we can definitely make that a policy so that the same reviewer is looking at the project from first submittal to approvals. Okay, yeah. those are all yeah. my, oh and sorry, David. Just to follow up, because I know you asked that earlier on the other projects about an expedited process. So we don't have one at this time, but it is something that we're looking at um, for the future, the probably nearer future. And, but the reality is there are a lot of projects 
through the process. And as we held, heard with the Melrose Triangle yeah. earlier, they're on their fifth submittal. And so each time they submit it, the staff has to go through the process of reviewing everything on those projects. And so it just takes time. Um, we don't want to rush things through and make mistakes or errors. So, I mean, as we're going through this process, like each time we're almost starting over. On, um, uh, and we're not completely starting over, but again, we don't want them to change something else in the plans and that gets missed. Um, so it is a thorough review each time. Understood. I just know other cities have expedited processes that people pay a fee for and then it's mm -hmm. expedited. So yeah. I'm just, especially with housing production on these vacant lots, that's my, I'm, I'm getting into commentary, so I need to correct myself. So we're going to go into, <laughs> do my colleagues have any more questions? No, thank you. Um, we're going to go to public comment. We have Mr. Nickel uh, to be followed by Mr. Watts. Come on down. Yeah, it's Price is Right tonight. Uh. George Nickel, 19-year resident of the city of West Hollywood. Good evening, Mayor and Vice Mayor and uh, Council Members. Uh, I'm really glad that you're bringing this up. Uh, from the map that staff provided, there are, there, are, there are abandoned properties all across the city, so I'm sure that it's a lot to keep track of, but I'm going to focus on the east side. As was mentioned in the last, uh, for the last two items, one developer left 15, over a dozen properties near where I live. And about a month ago, a neighbor took me on a walking tour of them and they were not secure. They simply were not secure. So one of them had a chain link fence. It was there, at one point it had been secure, but the entire corner was pulled down. There was an abandoned refrigerator. There was a porta potty that was tipped over. It wasn't safe. The neighbor lived beside one of these properties that is just it's a pile of plywood. It, it's fuel just waiting to be set on fire. She complained about rodent infestation. So of course, we, we, it's just a non-safe situation. So I'm really, really glad to hear not only is there a discussion about making certain that there is security, 24-hour security if necessary, but moving forward, making certain that if a developer comes forward that there is a bond or something. I don't understand how somebody can buy up 15 properties in, in one neighborhood, get approval to move forward and not complete any one of them, leaving a mess for all of us to deal with and clean up. So I'm really glad that this has been brought forward and hopefully we can secure these properties and more importantly, keep them from, from existing in the first place. People could have been living in these homes all this time. One of them is a lovely apartment building. It's still just standing there. It's empty. People could be living there. So thank you. Thank you so much, George. Uh, Rick Watts to be followed by our final speaker, Nick Roybo. Thank you, Council. Uh, Rick Watts, City of West Hollywood. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, uh, Director of Public Safety, Danny Rivas, and uh, uh, Eugene Alper and, and uh, other staff that have worked on this issue. Um, uh, as you probably guess, I'm the, the particular property that I'm concerned about is a 1280 Sweetser Avenue. Now, I notice that that is not even listed as a failed property although it is failed. It has been vacant, essentially abandoned, for years with a long history of, uh, of intrusions, uh, people breaking into it through the, the, the back, uh, at least two fires that I know of, one of which was an arson of cars next door. Um, it's a vermin breeding ground, a demonstrable uh, public nuisance, and, and uh, fire safety hazard that I, I've gone through all this to, uh, before. Um, I'm going to one-up George on, on this and, and uh, suggest that you seek to give yourselves the authority to order demolition. Now, I think as far as the, the concerns about uh, uh, these new powers that are, that are proposed, uh, perhaps encouraging developers' uh, uh, malfeasance, uh, I suggest you guys revisit the vacancy tax that, that uh, uh, Councilmember Meister uh, had suggested a while back, which you unfortunately voted down. Um, that, as well as an escalation of fines, uh, might go a long ways towards uh, dealing with that concern, but I think you really need to be able to order the demolition uh, of uh, some of these uh, properties um, if, the, the, uh, uh, if, if the landlord, such as this landlord at 1280 Sweetser, who's th thumbing his nose from 7,000 miles away, um, uh, 
don't do what they need to do to secure their property. That is still a disaster waiting to happen in the next Santa Ana win if, God forbid, it happens in the middle of the night when people are sleeping and the place torches off other apartment buildings. Thank you. Thank you. And Rick, it's number two on page three. It just says 1200 block of sweets, sir. And it says problematic, not there. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's there. You said it wasn't. Okay, great. Just wanted to make sure it wasn't not listed. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, Nick Roybal, please. As I was sitting here, mayor, vice mayor, council, and staff. As I was sitting here, I thought of the word for the evening. Oh, liquefaction. Bamboozled. Oh, yeah, good word. What happened on Ogden, south of Santa Monica Boulevard? Can anyone please, in detail, tell the people that live on Ogden, south of Santa Monica Boulevard, how they got fucked? Because we have. I invite every single person in this room to walk south of Santa Monica Boulevard down Ogden, and you will each see how every resident on Ogden got fucked fucked by this city and I choose my language closely that is the only word that defines how residents on Ogden have been treated by this city and by the developers that this city has had contracts with so how are we going to change that how are we going to make sure residents in this city aren't fucked over by developers what are we going to do Ordinances are a first step. And I appreciate Councilmember Meister earlier saying, yes, bring community into these meetings with developers. They need to know why they're getting fucked and how they're getting fucked. Again, the word for this evening is bamboozled. And the residents of this city are tired of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Second time public comment, by the way, so good job. <laughs> um, do we have any more questions for staff, or would you like to move on for comments? Nope. Why don't we move on to comments? Councilmember Heilman, would you like to start? Yes. I, um, as I said before, I appreciate staff bringing this forward. It gives staff an additional tool. Uh, an additional authority in appropriate situations to order the demolition of a building that is creating problems in the community. Um, I think that's something that we definitely need to do and have that power. We've seen examples of this over and over again. I understand Council Member Meister's concerns about not um, having buildings demolished that could be turned back into housing. But if a, prod, if a building gets to the point where staff has deemed it at risk, it's highly unlikely that that can be restored to permanent housing. It is in such a state of danger that the cost of bringing it back for housing is not going to, it's just not going to happen. It's not feasible. I want to correct something that Mr. Uh, Roybal said. We do not have contracts with developers developers own property and as any property owner they can come in and apply for permits to develop their property if their application fits within the zoning code and the requirements of the code then they can get their permits approved by the city but we don't enter into contracts with them and we also don't uh, evaluate their financial stability what happened in certain areas is a developer got in way over their head, got a lot of properties, got them entitled, but didn't have the resources to complete construction. That's why the banks took them back, and that's why we have somebody else coming in and trying to come in and fix that situation by getting those developments completed. But um, for those projects that are, or those properties that are not going to get um, actually developed appropriately and the existing structure is in a state of disrepair so dangerous for the community that it's deemed at risk our staff should have the authority to order it demolished yep. 
So I support the item. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilmember Meister. Thank you, Mayor. So while I generally support the item, I just want to you know, put a bug in everyone's head, and that is that the fact that the properties were allowed to get in, get in such disrepair um, is a problem for me. I think, you know, especially we talked about proactive code compliance um, and, you know, have added, you know, made it a policy that we will have more proactive code compliance. I think we have to be also looking at this whole idea of property owners letting their properties get into disrepair and that we need to start we need to either, if we don't, if it's not already on the books, then we need to put it on the books that property owners need to take care of their properties. And um, so I, uh, you know, because to get to that point of, as Council Member Howman said, that, you know, there's no hope, that took a long time. And I think that we need to be more proactive in trying to keep those properties in, in, um, in decent shape. And then I also would just again like to say that I think that during this time period where you're looking at these alternative mechanisms to authorize demolition, we need to be exploring alternate mechanisms to keeping properties rented. I think that's really, really important because part of you know this whole housing crisis is the fact that you know buildings are 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 being people are being LSed out, and then buildings are being uh, demolished or or doing nothing. And um, I think it would really behoove us to keep to, to find some way to to keep uh, to keep these properties properties rented. Thank you so much, Councilmember Shine. Do you have any comments? Um, yes, um, I, I I appreciate staff's work on this, and uh, I'm in favor of the, the strongest measures that we can take to ensure that these properties are. Um, secured uh, in all the ways we've been having this conversation uh, for you know, years and three years and um, the more the more we can do the better so thank you so much Councilmember Shine Vice Mayor Byers yeah I just thank you staff for your work on this to understand that 14 of these uh, properties are you know <clears throat> close to becoming a failure um, I know that we're working hard to prevent that from happening all the way and just want to uh, ensure that we are bringing the best tools possible forward so I'm supportive of what we have before us and thankful thank you uh, yes thank you and I will just add a few things um, I agree with councilmember Meister alternatives to keeping people rented I think that is definitely something that is worthwhile as long as people can stay in these homes however I do agree with councilmember Heilman with um, the ability and the um, of for staff to be able to tear down these buildings um, however um, when we look at how when they tear down these buildings the disrepair that then they go into um, is, is very concerning. Um, I routinely walk uh, the east side with my neighbors and friends. Um, I'm usually texting Danny, uh, the different properties owned by FMB Development, so I wanna thank Code for getting out there as soon as possible. We could go out there one night, secure a, a place, and then one night transients come in and, and then they, they take it all down, so it's a, it's a whack-a-mole process, you can't stop. And I also wanna say shame on FMB development. I mean, this is, uh, you know, I wasn't on the council when a lot of these things were made. They're done by right, because it's, you know, the type of the development that goes forward and the housing that would be put out. But then I look at an item that was on our consent calendar tonight regarding the housing element status, and then I look at all these, uh, uh, residential properties and I look at all the mix, missed opportunities for housing people in our city, um, especially in the den most densely populous area and that's the east side where we have a huge um, population. So we're missing even elements f to get people housed that can count towards our housing element which we're severely um, underwater on. Um, additionally, I think that these items that are specifically um, problematic or at risk need to be designated to have 24-hour security and proper lighting and um, uh, uh, and at their own charge. Um, Danny, I know you, I'm asking you a question off the cuff, but I know you might know it. How many of FMB's dev properties are now in receivership or are have gone into um, uh, uh, 
you, you know what I'm you know what I'm trying to ask you. How it's 21. How many properties is it again? So there's uh, 23 different 23. parcels. Yes. Um, we are aware of the lender. Um, uh, going through the receivership process on seven, seven. Uh, of those 23. We've also received notification that um, there may be a, an additional six to eight um, that may also uh, fall into that same category. Um, and then in addition to that, we've initiated our own uh, code enforcement action through our city prosecutor's office regarding a number of these properties. And so to your uh, question to your comment earlier along with some of the other council members regarding the problematic all of those are go actually going through that process um, One of them that you're seeing here on the list that's reflected as receiver um, We are going through that receivership process um, But I think you know the the crux of what we're bringing forth is really to enhance our security yeah. measures and really give us that capability um, You know lessons learned obviously and going through that process and making improvements um, you can certainly uh, speak for our uh, code enforcement team. Um, they certainly are trying to be as proactive um, as they can, in addition to responding to calls for service. Um, the proactive code compliance uh, program, I just want to respond in saying that what was recently um, initiated by the city council um, was related to multifamily uh, dwelling units and kind of doing more of a housing inspection uh, for occupied units. And so we have two contracted staff that are dealing with that. Um, and so they are not focused on the vacant properties. That's our existing team. Um, in addition to, again, responding to all the various calls for service. And so um, we'll continue to prioritize and make this um, an important um, aspect of the overall code enforcement program and making adjustments and bringing forth ordinance changes and asking for additional resources as we're um, evaluating the program. Thank you so much. And then my last comment is the city cannot be the weight that keeps these projects from going down. I am very troubled by the amount of items that are in plan check and I hear it every day from people that are trying to build, wanting to build and get it. The city cannot be preventing housing from being built. I'm very concerned about that. And so if my colleagues agree, I would also like, because I believe we have five votes here, to give direction to create uh, an expedited approval for these types of items that were mentioned by Ben. Because this, what I am seeing is the city is a hindrance. It needs to follow every process and do every check it needs to. However, we cannot be hindering the development of housing. And right now, while we have a, a bad actors, I do not like that I consider the city to be in that level right now for me to, to be stopping housing being built. So uh, that's where I'm at with this. And so I, if that needs to come back as a separate item, I'll be authoring it myself. Um, and so I'm seeing city attorney Langer shake her head or David Wilson. You mentioned earlier, there, it is something that we're working on, but you all can give us direction to <laughs> continue to do what we're doing. Well, I would like it to come back sooner rather than later. And, and Mayor, it just uh, in regards to the, the, the list that you're seeing here uh, pertaining to the vacant properties, can certainly tell you because also, uh, obviously we are intimately involved and we know these properties. Um, it, I can tell you with confidence the bulk that you're seeing in plan check is on the applicant's failure Great. to follow through with that process. Um, we can say that with confidence with the list that we have here um, as it relates to the plan check process. So. And, and that's good, great and grand, and I'm glad that it's the applicant, that it's not that, but this is not a comment that any five of us up here have not heard, regardless of what type of a project it is. And that's no blame. I believe you work very hard, but I think we need to create a better process to build these types of housing units so that way we can meet our housing goals. Because as many members of the public said today, people come before us and they say, housing, 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 and they try to subvert other types of rules, but then at the end of the day, we're not getting housing at all. So um, I believe Councilmember Heilman uh, has requested to speak. Well, I, I just wanted to follow up on, on your point, and I think maybe we should give direction to our city manager to look at what, in fact, are the delays in the building uh, process. Is it an issue where we need more staff? Is it an issue where we need an expedited process? Is it an issue where we need to say we want to prioritize housing projects in terms of plan check? 
um, and I, I've heard the same complaints yeah. you've had. Um, oftentimes they're not housing projects, they're commercial <laughs> projects, but I think the same concerns are, are expressed by some of the housing developers. We want the process to work, we want the, the city to enforce all of the codes, but we also want it to be done as efficiently and as effectively as possible, especially for housing projects, which is a priority for us. Understood. So would one of my colleagues like to make a motion? Uh, I would make a motion that we uh, introduce this ordinance on first reading. Sounds good. With that additional direction that With you With the gave. direction that's been given. I'll Thank second. you. Councilmember Shine, I heard you. Thank you very much. City Clerk? Councilmember Heilman? Aye. Councilmember Meister? Aye. Councilmember Shine? Aye. Vice Mayor Byers? Aye. And Mayor Eric Zuma. Aye. Thank you so much, everyone. Moving right along to item 4B, amendment to section 1128090 of the City of West Hollywood's code to clarify eligible areas to be permitted to convert temporary out zones to permitted permanent outdoor dining. Um, do my colleagues wish to have a staff report? Are we okay? I would like a brief report as to why this amendment is actually necessary. Sounds good. Now? Is it working now? Yep. yep. Yeah, okay, good. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, members of the City Council, Steve Campbell, Director of Public Works. Uh, tonight's item requests uh, the City Council to consider uh, an amendment, a minor amendment to the existing municipal code that would allow a business to use parking spaces in front of an adjacent business in a very limited set of circumstances as outlined in the staff report. Those circumstances include physical impediments and public infrastructure that must remain accessible, including items such as electrical vaults, storm drains, light poles, guy wires, et cetera. Um, these would prohibit the business from using the parking space directly in front of the business. Um, the proposed amendment allows um, for that business that is affected to use up to three on-street parking spaces in front of the immediately adjacent business as long as the property owner and the business owner of that establishment uh, or the tenant as applicable provides annual written consent to the city for use thereof. Uh, this is a very minor uh, amendment and it only exists in a couple of lo locations that staff has been working with the property owner or the business owner. Uh, and so this would allow us to basically a way to provide a yes to that business owner to do the uh, outdoor dining. Thank that you so much. That concludes my comments. Do my colleagues have questions? Councilmember Meister. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so to confirm, uh, the landlord and the tenant of the neighboring business both have to say it's okay to take up the parking space in front of their store? Correct, and they would have to provide that to the city on an annual ba basis in a written format. But these, these um, out zones are, uh, maybe I'll go like this, permanent. I mean, in some cases, cement is being poured. So we know that businesses come and go, and sometimes they go in a year. So the business that has built the out zone, do you think that they're going to be OK about removing the out zone after one year if a new business moves in and 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 they don't want them in front of their storefront? That would, that would give the city the ability to revoke and they would have to remove it. Okay, um, has, a, has any, have any parking studies been done uh, since the ARC was built to determine parking needs in the area, in this, in the uh, Rainbow District area? Or, uh, or Melrose, I'm not aware of or any. Melrose area? Yeah, I'm not aware of any studies that have okay. been done recently. Because what you're saying is we would be losing an additional parking space in those circumstances. Because it's not like you're going to keep the parking space on the spot where there is the infrastructure underneath. That's correct. You would lose those spaces. Um, 
and I'm sorry, I lost your Yeah, question. so you're, yes, so you're, you're losing lose an extra spaces. space, basically. You're, yes. you're losing an extra parking space. Correct. But okay. again, it's a very limited set of circumstances where we've had this, this issue come up as we've been working with the businesses. Yeah, no, I understand, but we haven't done a parking study in any of those areas. No. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. No questions? Um, no, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Vice Mayor Byers? Yes, I have two questions, thank you. Um, first, uh, the use of parking spaces, does this distinguish whether those parking spaces are strictly allowed for the outside space itself, or could it be used for as a pedestrian walkway? Uh, I think that that's an interesting look. It would, and it gets back to the policy, I think it would be for the pedestrian walkway or the, the outdoor dining. I think you could look at so it. So it doesn't, ways. there's no determination in this, so it could be open? We'd have to go back to the policy and look at that. Okay. Um, and then another question, do we know how many businesses are in the position to need to be, rem to, that would have to remove their out zones by that June 1st deadline? Ooh, I don't have that number. Laura Byrie is here, I believe. Okay. Do you know how many are? You can just throw up some fingers. <laughs> More than one, hopefully. Good evening, Mayor, members of council. My name is Laura Byrie, City's Director of Economic Development. The current guidelines that the City Council have adopted require that businesses that are ineligible to move forward in the process, which are businesses that are in the public right-of-way on sidewalks that are greater than the 19 feet, those individual businesses do have to remove them in time for the June 1st deadline. Um, we do have several businesses that have opted to already remove them um, in our Rainbow District area. We still have several businesses that we're working with regarding those removals, and they can do that in advance of that deadline. Mm -hmm. With regard to the number of businesses, I'm happy to do a quick tally on my computer and then give that back to you if okay. you'd like. That's helpful. Thank you. The, yeah, I don't need the exact number, but that was helpful information. Thank you. And then do you know, Laura, if um, the policy itself distinguishes between the parking spaces being able to be used for pedestrian walkway or if it's strictly as an, the out zone space itself? Yes, so the new policy is based on the out zone spaces themselves, okay. um, but I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at the uh, guidelines that I have right here and get a clarification on that for you. Steve, uh, regarding, is that all your questions? Uh, uh, Steve, regarding um, the parking spaces conversation, uh, I know that this applies to a, a few businesses. It's it's no greater than four or five, right? I think it might even be two, two yeah. right? Uh, yeah. So aren't those parking spaces already out? They're they're not in use already, though. I'm I'm piggybacking off of what my colleague said about they would lose an additional space, but I'm trying to think of these two businesses where this has been an issue, and those parking spaces would move down a little bit and not being used? They would move down and then Got the it. existing ones would come back. Got it, okay. So there, there may be a net loss in there, um, just depends upon how it lays out. Great, and to go back to what Vice Mayor Byer said to uh, what Laura might be able to answer is that these spaces between pedestrian, what was the other aspect? Pedestrian, uh, the out zone, Sorry, yeah, but these wouldn't be able to be utilized for valet, right? Probably not. Great. Okay, just wanted to make that clear. Yep. Great, so I can go ahead and answer Vice Mayor Byer's question. The boardwalk style is not in the new guidelines. So boardwalk style is what you see currently in the Rainbow District, yeah. where you have created a pedestrian pathway out of like a board, um, boardwalk area, and so then the dining is up against. Um, that is not in the new guidelines to do boardwalk style uh, out zones. So the parking spaces could not be used to create the extension of the pedestrian walkway. The, if the parking spaces were used, they would have to be for the out zone themselves in this. For the outdoor dining for themselves. The outdoors, okay. Under the new guidelines adopted by the city council, that is okay. correct. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We have one public commenter. Uh, Right, just one, no one on Zoom? Wonderful, Jacob Shaw, please come on down. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, and Honorable Council Members. Speak into the mic. 
Oh, okay, sorry, I'll lean down. <clears throat> Just uh, want to speak about item 4B. Um, we fall into a little bit of a weird category here because our sidewalks are 19 feet. So we are limited to, uh, I believe it's a six or eight foot pathway. Problem is, is that on the south side of Santa Monica Boulevard, the tree wells are one row, if you will, of cement in. So that means that from the curb, there's uh, a meter, and then there's another section of sidewalk that has a tree, and then that's when the measuring of the sidewalk starts. It essentially limits the sidewalk side. So if you're walking on the northbound, or north side of Santa Monica, you'll notice their patios have always been larger, and they've been disproportionately larger because they can go 10 feet and still have that big walkway. And we want to ensure that big walkway because we want to be a complement to the neighborhood, not a hindrance to the neighborhood. So we would need two things to happen uh, to the ordinance. One, we would need to be able to either move a tree or relocate the tree, or we would need special consideration on our side to match the patios on the other side, limiting the sidewalk side, considering it like kind of a meandering path. Or the last option would be the boardwalk style. So we gladly drew up plans to put the curb out a little bit, put the walkway out, pay for all of that, and have the kind of the, the pathway go around and then come back in. And we would make it beautiful with trees and branches and, and places to sit and all that. It wouldn't just be some ugly square sidewalk. We would want it to be beautiful in our city. So I would respectfully ask for two options. One would be to either amend the ordinance so that we could have equity between the two sides of the street or allow us to be able to have an extension or something to come to a result for this because it's absolutely essential for our business. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jacob. All right, we're going to move on to comments. I have a question. Yes, go, go ahead. Steve, why, why are the trees located differently on the two sides of the street? Is, I mean, is there a physical reason for it? Is it infrastructure? I, I'm assuming it's infrastructure I don't know specifically. The, uh, one of the major differences is the sidewalk on the north side ranges anywhere from like 23 to 25 feet. And on the south side is 19 to 20. So the sidewalks on the north side are actually wider. There's more room, and, and the double row is probably spaced accordingly. Okay, thank you. Lauren? Um, Councilmember Meister, would you like to begin any commentary? So I, I think that. I think that this is kind of a recipe for disaster <laughs> uh, because I don't think it's going to stop at the at the two or three spots as we see. I mean, I, I don't think that when you were considering the change in this ordinance, you were you were considering beaches, for example, and the and the situation that that they have. Um, that wasn't one of the ones I think that was in that three or four or five. I think Jackie had texted me that it was like five different businesses. Um, but I also don't think we should be losing uh, parking spaces um, for outdoor dining, period. So, and I was probably the one person who voted against it anyway, so I'm gonna just say that I'm gonna be voting no, but I do still think it is a recipe for disaster if tenant and landlord uh, of a neighboring business have to approve it, and it's an annual thing, and then all of a sudden, a very expensive renovation has to go away. I mean, I don't know that that's really worth worth it for us. I think the plan that this, that staff came up with, that was approved by by you, my colleagues, um, seemed to have been very well thought out. And this just seems like something to to fix a problem for two or three businesses. That I think it's going to end up growing into something different, and I don't think it's worth it. So I'm going to be voting now. Thank you so much, Councilmember Meister. Councilmember Heilman? Sure. I, I just want to start my remarks by reminding everyone that there is no entitlement to outdoor dining in public right away on the city streets or on the city sidewalks. We uh, allowed this temporarily during COVID just to respond to the need of our businesses for outdoor spaces for people to uh, go uh, when they couldn't be inside. Um, we approved a, a program and, and guidelines for continued outdoor dining because obviously it's popular with a lot of people, 
but um, some of the businesses are, are not going to be able to comply, and I'm, I'm fine with that. We knew that when we adopted those guidelines. I think the proposed amendment staff has come forward with um, is addressing a particular technical issue having to do with a certain um, uh, permanent uh, public facilities and, and the impact on uh, the ability of a business to have outdoor dining when we have um, utilities and other um, uh, public or, or governmental uh, functions that are blocking that, that pathway. So I, I'm supportive of this. I'll, I'll go along with it. I do share uh, Council Member Meister's concerns that this might be opening a, a can of worms, but I will trust staff's recommend or traf, staff's a, um, a assessment that this would only apply to two properties. I, I do agree that the one-year period seems problematic. I would, uh, I would say that that approval has to be for a longer period of time, two or three years, because otherwise, why as a business would I do this knowing that I'm at the risk of my neighbor suddenly pulling the plug on me? They're not gonna invest in this kind of outdoor dining. So if we're gonna do it, the period should be a longer period in my mind. Um, we are gonna take a quick recess real quick. Everything's fine. Uh, so we'll be right back in about five minutes. It's all good. Uh, we're going to call the meeting right back to order. Uh, Councilmember Shine. Yes, um, I uh, I have a disclosure and a recusal, and I will be re uh, leaving the room for the rest of the item and the vote. I was uh, uh, given a contribution from Jacob Shaw, 
Um, and so I'm uh, under the Levine Act. I need to make this disclosure or recuse myself and leave the room. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Shine. Vice Mayor Byers. <laughs> you got this. Do you want me to go? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank staff for this. Um, I, I've been talking with, I believe, these businesses, um, and I, I, uh, I really think that if whatever and all that we can do for one business, two business, three businesses, that's the job of our city to make our businesses thrive, which I'm so glad to see new ones opening up every day. It's lovely. Um, you know, it's another new business, right? Um, insert that comment on my Instagram. But um, I really think that this is a common sense fix. I think it's practical and approachable. So I, I agree with what Councilmember Hammond said. I do believe that the one year item to what Councilmember Meister was saying, and I believe Councilmember Hammond is problematic and it kind of sets us up for that. So I actually would, um, if my colleagues are amenable, think two to three years. I'm open to the number, I think, to show that agreement. Uh, and that, um, I think, does stability um, and allows, if there is significant um, construction, I mean, businesses sign 10 plus year agreement leases anyway, so I don't think that should be beyond it. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. Vice Mayor Byers? Yeah, I, thank you. I in support of the an extension as well. I think two, three years is a great idea so we can sort of have some predictability and that brings me to a bigger point that we don't unfortunately get to address in this specific item, but I think the conversation continues to be that we are really addressing a, a vision for what the Rainbow District can look like and have been sort of fumbling around with policy to understand how to achieve that. The pandemic did expose a new way for us to be gathering and thinking as people. Um, I am not totally in support of having a parking space in front of every business, especially in an area that is so hyper pedestrian focused, dealing with bike, uh, bike lanes. Um, and so I just in general think that the Rainbow District has uh, a next chapter awaiting. And I think businesses are eager to sort of think about a different vision for that. And so I want to sort of put that out there and invite that conversation because I don't think that this amendment is going to get us all the way to some of the issues that we want to see um, solved that the out zone sort of allowed us to think about differently. Um, but with that, I am supportive of what the amendment has to uh, offer tonight. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I was sort of thinking about this idea of the June 1st deadline coming uh, so up, up to pride. And if there is a concern or issue with businesses getting it done by then or trying to push up against that deadline, given what big opportunity there is that pride weekend, if there's any sort of interest or openness from this council to extend it to June 1st for any, if, or July 1st, I'm sorry, um, it, you know, in the way that that allows for one last summer fling for our businesses in the Rainbow District. Um, but I just wanted to put that out there as a thought. Um, I'm uh, completely open to, uh, I think, an extension of the deadline as permitted by, I don't know if it would be Nick or our city manager if June 1st isn't the deadline, but um, if it's not feasible, but um, I'll leave it open to my colleagues on how we would like to talk about that. And I know you're voting no, so it's okay. Um, Councilmember Heilman. Well, I, I am concerned about extending the deadline yeah. because that's not before us tonight, yeah. but I'm also concerned for another reason, and that is we will have large crowds, and some of these out zones actually um, in some places impede the flow of, tra of pedestrian traffic on the sidewalk. So, uh, you know, if we're going to have that conversation, it needs to be a separate yeah. conversation. I'm prepared to move the item with... Uh, changing it to a two-year uh, agreement, and Lauren seems to have a question or comment about that. So the code as it reads now requires the consent on an annual basis if you're, if you're operating, um, I believe, on the sidewalk next to a business. And so this language mirrors that annual requirement to say, if you're going to go in the parking spaces in front of the neighboring business, you submit it on an annual basis. So are we talking about changing it in one place or just talking about changing it for the parking space in front of the adjacent business? Maybe we should just leave it annual so it's consistent with both and then staff could come back if we have experience. And I'm thinking some of the neighboring businesses might want to just approve for one year to mm -hmm. see how it works and then subsequently enter into longer term agreements but why don't we just leave it consistent okay. for now? Sounds good. That's okay with my colleague. Yep. With that, I'll move the, move the item. 
Would you like to second, second it? Second it. Wonderful. There's a motion and a second. We'll go Cal to a vote. Thank you. Council Member Heilman? Aye. Council Member Meister? No. Mayor Schein has recused herself. Vice Mayor Byers? Aye. And Mayor Erickson? Aye. Thank you so much. Um, I, we are gonna move on to, thank you very much, Laura and Steve. Um, we're gonna move on to 5A now, <laughs> unfinished business, Willoughby, Vista Gardner, and King Street Design concept plan. As staff comes in, I'll go get our call. <laughs> Do we want a staff report? Nope, no staff report? No. Nope, got it. Lauren, do you want a staff report? Would you like a staff report? Okay. Hello, everyone. So uh, we, although I'm sure the staff report is lovely, um, don't need one. So we're going to go right into questions from my colleagues, and I'm going to I'm going to start with you, Councilmember Meister. Thank you. My green light is already on. Uh, so, um, first of all, I just wanted to confirm that the diverter idea has been eliminated because I know that that didn't that wasn't very popular from everything I've read. That is correct. Uh, it's not in our recommendation based on the feedback from the community. Okay. And then, in terms of feedback that you got, um, I know that we have to decide between option one A and option one B regarding uh, Gardner. Um, do we know if the residents, the, the, the residents have been asked which they would prefer? Option 1A or option 1B? Not specifically, but we've done uh, a series of utilization, parking utilization uh, surveys. Um, those spaces are well used. Um, during the daytime, I would say 50 to 60 percent utilization. Early morning and late night, it's around 80 to 90 percent utilization. So those spaces are being used um, pretty frequently. And so that law, in other words, the loss of the 22 spaces, which is rec which is what part of option 1A, would be a loss to them. Correct. Um, another consideration that you may want to look into is we could delay the conversion until because one of the problems that um, that we can foresee is because we're eliminating of so much parking on fountain parking could be um, exacerbated the conditions because could be exacerbated for the side street so an option is to um, hold off until so in other words 1b to decide on 1b for now and see how things and go. Then, and, and then after we uh, install phase one of Fountain, which also includes removal of parking, we'll have a much better idea of the, the situation there. But we're doing a streetscape project on Fountain first. So yeah. that's... The, don't get ahead of yourself, Bob. No, I mean, the, I mean the parking hasn't been taken over. The parking is I'm, I'm still optimistic. there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, so we haven't... Yeah, yeah so haven't I, mean, yeah. I mean, I could still see us still delaying option 1A if, if, if to see how 1B works. But uh, so again, like, do you know how many buildings are on that street that don't provide parking to their tenants? Because I know they're all, it's pretty much almost all multifamily housing. And you're telling me that it's 80%, 85%, the parking spaces are 85% occupied, and you're taking away more than 20% of the spaces, is that right? Um, for that two block section, yes. right, where uh, I think we have 39 parking spaces right now and um, we would end up losing about 17, 17 spaces. I thought it was 22 spaces. Oh, 17 remaining. Yeah, so you're Reduced taking away, 17, sorry. you're taking away probably, I, I can't 20, do this in my head, 60% of the spaces. Roughly, yes. And you already know that 80% of the spaces are utilized. So that's going to mean that there's a percentage of people who aren't going to be able to park in front of their buildings at night. So. If you go with option 1A. Correct. Um, but I want to caveat by saying that the surveys are just a snapshot in time. Uh, so 
parking fluctuates is seasonal. So until we um, test it or, or pilot it, it's hard to really get a good sense of well, how, how many Anecdotally, I can tell you that any time I've gone to the park and not parked in the parking lot but have gone up that gardener, there's never a parking space on there available, and that's usually daytime. So I, I believe your, your assessment in terms of parking, of how much parking is not available. That's my questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Councilmember Shine, do you have any questions? No. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Heilman. Yes. Um, so I know I'm going out of order, but just a comment. I remember when we put in the angled parking, we put it in because the street was oftentimes over 100% occupied with parking. And that was because a lot of those buildings don't have parking for the residents. Um, my questions, um, one has to do with reverse um, angle parking. I've seen that in one location and it appears to me to be a disaster. I understand why you're recommending it because people pulling out of those parking spaces would have greater visibility, but I think most people do not understand reversed angle parking. They don't understand that you have to pull forward and then back into the space. Uh, they do this, I think it's up by, uh, I want to say Camarillo or around there in their main street and it just looks like accidents waiting to happen. So are you confident that residents are going to understand this, uh, that they're going to actually do this and like it and how do, are, are we then going to ticket people who pull into an angled space and aren't backed into it? Um. If we sign it as reverse back in only, yes, then that would be a violation, but that's something we need to talk to parking enforcement on. But to your earlier or your other question, um, it is a, a different way of parking, so whenever you have something new, it always takes time to get adjusted. Um, but I do wanna say that um, studies have shown that reverse in parking is a lot safer in terms of accidents, that the, those numbers are there, so I could, you know, provide those numbers. But it has been tested that it is beneficial in terms of safety. Yeah, I I, I understand that why it would be. I just don't believe that people will actually do what you're telling them to do. Um, my other question has to do with um, there's one section. Um, I believe it's on Vista or Gardner uh, in the LA section where you're recommending the lanes be on um, next to the curb uh, behind the parking tucked in. But that's only for a very small segment of that. That seems really strange. I understand the idea behind it, but it looks like people would be riding down the street, sort of in the middle of the street with Sharrows, and then they would go into, for a small segment, um, a bike lane that is in between the curb and the parking space. Is that correct? No, actually, for most of the section, um, it is uh, uh, protected bike lanes between the curb and the parking. It's the last two blocks, the options A and B, that we're requesting um, uh, your uh, input on. So the, uh, I'm, are you talking about Willoughby or are you talking about Gardner? Mr. Gardner. Okay. Well, that segment is a very small segment. I mean. Yeah, I think if I, if I could just clarify, I think it's um, from Lexington to Willoughby. Is that correct? Correct. So from the section from Lexington to Willoughby would all have that configuration of being between the parking and the curb. So from Fountain to Lexington, it would be in the street, and then people would be directed to go behind the reverse in angled parking till they get to Santa Monica, they cross that, and then they would go another block south, or two blocks south. 
they would go all the way to Willoughby. Willoughby. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I have comments about that, but I'll reserve that for the comment time. Thank you so much. Vice Mayor Byers, do you have any questions? I have a question. Um, the traffic diverter that was at Ogden on Willoughby, was there another conversation had about traffic diverters on Willoughby after that? Um, no, uh, we had several public workshops and also the surveys and um, there was an overwhelming uh, opposition to having diverters on Willoughby, so we did not pursue that. Yeah. And I, I see 89 people in support of a diverter and then 200 opposed to it. So um, do we have a breakdown of who was opposed to it and who was in support of it? We don't, like, have, we okay. don't have that detail. And that was a statistically valid survey? No, it wasn't, right? I didn't think so. So I'm just saying it's self-selection. So to, to reiterate what my, I'm sorry, were you done with your questions? Okay, thank you. That was, I, my questions were, um, of the, um, my questions were of the of the nature that were mentioned earlier today. We got negative feedback on the diverter, but it's not statistically valid, so there's no way to know if they weren't self-selected or like Joe and Bob did it 500 times. Well, we not you, Bob, of no. course, <laughs> but you know. We did check for IP addresses and make sure they didn't vote twice and all that good stuff. Um, but I would say that. Uh, all the mailers were concentrated to yeah. that neighborhood. And the three locations where we had the demonstration projects, there were posters there, again, aimed at the residents of that neighborhood. So we feel like we, we, feel like we captured the, 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 um, the opinions of that neighborhood. Um, of course, you know, someone driving through could have taken the survey, but I don't think that number is significant. Yeah, and that's because 60% of the people are passed through traffic that don't live in the neighborhood, right? That's what we're estimating, yes. Understood, thank you. Um, and then, uh, was there, I, I can open it up, but the traffic study for this area, how many cars exactly were going down on any single day? Well, and if you don't have it, it's totally No, fine. I have that. Um, on Willoughby, east of Fairfax, we're looking at about four to 5,000 per day, <laughs> which is roughly twice the amount as Willoughby on the west side of yeah. Fairfax. So um, what we're um, gathering is that a lot of that cut through happens or starts and ends at Fairfax, um, trying to yeah. you know, avoid congestion. Because the moment you go south, that north, I'm sorry, the south, East corner is the city of LA. That that weird sandwich, um, lovely sandwich shop, whatever it is. Yes. That okay. That right. Um, uh, because of healthy streets, LA that passed uh, on Tuesday. Um, what implication or ability would we be able to to get Fairfax and uh, Willoughby to to Melrose repaid? Because I, we're connecting a lot of routes, because I know, uh, what's the street? That's just down two more, but that's another alternative route. Warren. Warren. Waring, right? Waring, yeah. yeah. Um, but <clears throat> is there, any, is there a, an ability to talk to the city of LA of getting that, that paved? Or will healthy, can we look into how healthy streets could help implement these types of ways to improve the street infrastructure? Yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of... Uh, Great. Uh, Opportunities there. Great, because I'm tired of popping tires <laughs> until I get to Willoughby. Um, all right, uh, we, I see someone shaking their head back there, that's right. Um, and that's good, because that means it's not just me. Um, we're gonna move on to public, do all my colleagues, we're good? Great, public comment. Uh, Robert Bryant to be followed by Kimberly Winnick. to be here to speak uh, today and participate in functional democracy. <laughs> democracy is kind of um, getting hammered on the federal level, so I'd love to prove our detractors wrong here in a small little micro level. Democracy works, and this is great. I'm here to express major, major support for this plan. It's, uh, I absolutely love it. 
Um, I live my life up and down Vista Gardner, I mean, up and down Willoughby. Uh, the Willoughby portion of this project from Target all the way to the Abbey, every day. I live on it every day. Um, and I'm not alone. For cyclists, this is a huge connector for both sides of our city. Um, as the plan indicates very well, we're all trying to stay safe on our designated bike route until we can you get to the north-south connection connectors to get up to that bike lane on Santa Monica, you know, so we can get over into Boys Town and to happy hour at ITOPS. <laughs> we love this route. It's a lifeline. It, it really is. So I understand drivers wanting to avoid traffic on Melrose and Santa Monica. You know, a lot of this is about traffic calming on Willoughby to, to stop people from using Willoughby as their, the path of least resistance. But, and I get that, and as a car driver myself, I'm guilty of doing the same thing. However, for cyclists and pedestrians and residents who live along Willoughby, um, it's just poopy. It's poopy. And this plan fixes that problem, you know. It makes the existing bike route what it's meant to be, which is a bike route. Uh, it's fantastic. For the record, I am a cyclist by choice. I also have a car, as I mentioned. I live um, on Stanley at Willoughby, so I see the importance of this project from all perspectives. Um, as, a, as a resident, as a, as a bike commuter, and as a car driver, and I get it. And those diverters are weird because I hate them too. But we're talking about local car traffic, not the crosstown traffic, which is kind of what this project is really aiming at, at diverting, at getting rid of. Local traffic still exists. Um, so we see the importance. Okay, anyway, thank you. Appreciate it. Good job. And uh, please vote for this. It's a great plan. Thank you so much, Robert. Be safe out there. Kimberly Winnick to be followed by Kevin Burton, who's our last uh, public commenter. I'm Kimberly Winnick, a longtime resident of West Hollywood, a bicycle rider, a pedestrian, a driver. And I participated in a number of the exploration projects that were done along Willoughby, the walking, the taking measure of the potholes and the various pedestrian issues and bicycle issues. It's been a long time. I'm really happy to see that we're going forward and I wanna thank you very much for that. And I have only one, one concern um, with bulb outs as a cyclist, particularly when you're trying to get people to ride to the, to the, you're supposed to ride as far to the right as is practicable. Bulb outs make that dangerous. The most safe, the safest way to ride a bicycle is very straight. So if there are cars parked and then there aren't cars parked, you don't go in and out. You hold a steady line that makes you predictable. Bulb outs mean that you need to ride a little bit further out or else you can get pinned in. So as it's being designed, either have a pass through the bulb out for bicycles or design the bulb outs in a way that they don't impede the bicycles running. It's, if you're going like, you know, if, if, if you're trying to ride to the right and there's a car right next to you and there's a bulb out, you got to stop. And we're actually trying to go somewhere in our bicycles, too. It's not just playing. So I thank you very, very, very much for doing this. Let's get it done. Let's get it done right. And um, it's good to have bike lanes where we can actually encourage people who don't ride bicycles yet to come out and give it a try because it doesn't feel so spooky scary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Kevin Burton is our last speaker. Good evening, Council. Kevin Burton, resident of West Hollywood. And I'm speaking this evening on behalf of the West Hollywood Bicycle Coalition. And we thank staff for their diligent efforts over the past six and a half years since the passage of the 2017 Bicycle and Pedestrian mobility plan for working on what were two of the highest priority items in that plan. Bike lanes on Vista Gardner and traffic calming on Willoughby Avenue, connecting to Santa Monica Kings Road. Uh, we support passage of this plan and we would like to comment on one of the uh, questions that are currently in the proposal and two additions we think should be incorporated in the plan. The current proposal gives council an option for Gardner Street and extending the proposed bicycle lanes north from Lexington to Fountain, which is currently a class three bike route and there, of course, is discussion of 
upgrading those bicycle facilities in Fountain Avenue. Or uh, the other option is just to leave it as it is with parking. We strongly oppose option 1B, breaking the bike lane network. We need a continuous network from Willoughby, Vista Gardner, up to Fountain, and not having little piecemeals of bike lanes here and there. And it's a special, especially a problem where you have angled parking, because what's going to happen, parking protected bike lanes, bicyclists are be coming up between the parallel parked cars and the curb. They're going to have to swing out in front of the parked cars uh, into traffic, go around to get out into the lane around the angled parking. Very dangerous, very foolish step that would be. Um, we also support for Cheryl's on uh, Willoughby Avenue, making them green back. And both of these parallel um, protected, parking protected bike lanes and the green back Cheryl's Kevin, are current best thank practice. You so thank you. All right, we're gonna move on to comments and I'm going to... Sorry, Mayor, if I may? Yes. Right here, sorry. Um, I wanted to, for the record, um, uh, state that there is a citizen position slip submitted by John Hayes in support of item 5A, specifically 1A, the option 1A. Sounds good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Councilmember Hamlin, would you like to start? Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone who came out to speak and thank you to our staff for all of their work on this project. There's a lot here that I am very supportive of and supportive of the concept, uh, especially the, the uh, Willoughby section of this. I think it's, it's going to, um, as one of the speakers uh, mentioned, it's going to make it uh, much more desirable for those cyclists who are currently using it and likely uh, attract others. It's also going to make it more desirable for pedestrians. Um, and I don't think it actually hinders um, people who are in other vehicles. It just uh, forces them to sort of slow down and be more mindful. So I, I'm supportive of that. I have concerns about um, the Gardner Vista portion of this. Um, as uh, my colleague, Councilmember Meister, brought up, I don't think we've really uh, informed the residents whose parking would be lost about uh, this particular proposal. I think there are a lot of people in that neighborhood who will be uh, reacting with a great deal of outrage uh, because this parking is there. It's not parking that's being used for commercial businesses, it's largely being used by residents who live in that neighborhood who don't have parking. And I am not supportive of the option that would remove that, that parking. So I, um, contrary to, to Kevin, I actually support item 1B. I think it's the only fair compromise. Um, I know that cyclists would prefer option 1A but we have to also look at and be concerned about um, other people. We can't just be addressing the needs of one group of people in the community and ignoring others. Um, in, in terms of um, the protected lanes, I know Kevin mentioned that that is the actual um, uh, sort of preferred method. I have a lot of skepticism about it and the reason I do is I drive on San Vicente all the time. They put in these protected bike lanes between the curb and the parking. They're not being utilized. Uh, they did the same thing in the city of LA near San, uh, USC, um, protected bike lanes in between the curb and parking. I don't think they're being utilized as was uh, planned and uh, as people thought they would be utilized. For whatever reason, it may be technically the preferred method, but I think many people actually feel safer, even though they shouldn't, riding uh, between the moving vehicles and parked cars 
rather than riding along the curb. Um, and I think one of the concerns is uh, what Kevin mentioned is that when they get to an intersection, they often have to then come out into the intersection ahead of the, the cars, and that creates a great deal of confusion, or they're coming out and turning vehicles don't actually see them. So I, I have concerns about that. Um, my, my big concern, though, is that, that area and not removing the parking. I, I'm very skeptical that our residents are going to buy this reverse uh, angled parking. All of, the, all of the technicians can say it's safer, the studies can say it's safer, but I've observed it in, in actual practice in um, Calabasas or wherever it was I was in, uh, uh, and I didn't feel safer, and I don't know that other drivers felt safer um, as a result. So I'm very supportive of it, but I'm supportive of option 1B, not 1A. Thank you so much, Councilmember Meister. <clears throat> Someone keeps putting my name up there by themselves. It's the city clerk. You can, bl you can okay, blame I just, her. <laughs> I was thinking, am I doing that? And I don't, through, through ESP, ESP or something? Okay, so um, I also ag agreed that um, I prefer option 1B. I think uh, to lose over 50%, I think it's 56% of the parking uh, uh, on Gardner is going to be problematic. Um, there, is, there is limited parking in that area. Plus, you have the park and people parking around the area who don't want to park in the parking lot. So there's always something going on around there. Um, I was curious about the bulb outs, uh, what uh, Kimberly brought up about the making a c cut through a bulb out so that a bike could, if it was going up, could it could go th like sort of through the bulb out. Is that a possibility? Um, it has been used in other, sorry. It has been used in other areas. What we need to do is do the engineering and make sure that there's enough uh, enough real estate to do both the bulb out and the pass through. Yeah, I mean, I'd be interested in you, uh, you know, looking at that, at that option. Um, so I would, you know, I would um, be supportive of, uh, of what staff has proposed with option 1B and, um, and then we can always see how the reverse parking goes because I'm sure we'll, we'll find out soon enough and um, and let's see how it goes in terms of maybe doing maybe additional outreach um, on the parking issue if if we want to think about changing that to parallel spaces to create a lane. But um, I think at this point, I think I think those residents would would be very very surprised by it. I I can only imagine they would have been here had they known that this was even happening. So um, I just think that 56% of parking spaces lost is a lot. So, but that's my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Were the residents in the, in the neighborhoods notified? They were notified of the project, yes. So you sent out stuff, I mean, to Councilmember Meister's point, I mean, you didn't put on a postcard, you're losing your parking spot tomorrow, but like they were notified, right? Well, we were, they were notified of the project um, during the outreach process, but the recommendation to remove parking, that was not um, communicated to them exactly. Yeah, because they have to understand what the project is. Right. They have to care. To buy in. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. Vice Mayor Byers? Uh, thank you. Um, I'm firmly supportive of option one, the parking protected bike lanes on Vista Gardner from Willoughby all the way to Fountain. Um, cyclists are going to need a way to have safe access to Fountain and protected bike lanes are that. Um, I do not want to compromise on cyclist safety for motorist convenience, period. And I think that's what we risk doing with not promoting option 1A. Um, I know that parking is uh, something that needs to be considered and it has been for a very long time, and this is a proposal about looking at the safest route for cyclists. 
and that is option 1A uh, before us. Uh, I am confident that there are very clever solutions floating around to address the many uh, parking issues that we continue to have, um, but that can be done in a more comprehensive way than looking at this protected bike lane as the place that we compromise. Um, and I just, you know, respectfully, San Vicente is not an adequate um, comparable solution to what we're, or a, a comparison to what we're talking about. It's not part of a network of cycling, and it is inappropriate to look at that failure as an um, exact comparison to what we're trying to develop in a network of cycling here in West Hollywood. Um, I also just will remind us that as a council, we agree that protected bike lanes are the policy that we wanna follow when we have this space. And we didn't agree to policy that promotes parking over bike lanes. And so I think we have to hold that as our higher point here as we're making these tough decisions in our neighborhoods. Um, cyclist visibility is absolutely critical and as part of the sharrows that must exist when we don't have the space, I want to see those green backed. Um, I think that uh, is something that we need to look at frankly, throughout the rest of our city. And I know that this is just a narrow piece of our cycling network, but I will be coming forward with a broader look at making sure the sharrows, as we continue to repave and repaint, will have green backing to them. It's just a visibility factor that makes cyclists sort of understand where they're supposed to go, makes cars understand that there's gonna be a cyclist there and helps us uh, use that space more readily and wisely. Um, a couple other things that I noticed, and I just wanna sort of emphasize, there's um, a, a contention here um, with whose way forward uh, is the one on the streets and push buttons um, continue to sort of insist that cyclists and pedestrians have to uh, state that they exist in order to be recognized, whereas the rest of our infrastructure and our streetscape allows for cars to automatically be recognized. And so I know it's often a cost decision that we look at, but I don't wanna go the inexpensive and thus inconvenient route for cyclists and pedestrians. I would like us to look at the automated detection route and ensure that we have those sort of detection loops at any traffic signal that a cyclist would appear at um, in term for this corridor. That'll allow for a cyclist to continue moving at a smooth network pace. Um, it allows them to sort of compete with vehicular traffic if they're recognized and acknowledged in those intersections and it's a safer route. Um, in addition, I don't know that this was actually a part of it or not, but leading pedestrian intervals, um, giving pedestrians and cyclists that extra 10 seconds you know, to get across the corridor, um, I would like to see that as well as part of the uh, sort of you know, intersection plan. Um, just to say that you know, the Willoughby plan itself is allowing for a transformation to this neighborhood in a really positive way. Any of those traffic circles can include greenery if they're invested in well, not just with plastic bollards, but much more hardy infrastructure that allows for some of that, and that's a really exciting thing to see. Um, I know that we had gotten some comments on speed bumps or the speed humps, but the ones I understand are coming forward are ones that allow for cyclists to travel through them and pass through them, not have to crawl over them the same way that cars do, and I think that's the right type of move for those neighborhoods. Um, anything that can slow down traffic is beneficial to safety, and that's what we need to be looking at. That's the whole point of this plan. Um, and with that, I know that the traffic diverter was eliminated at Ogden. I think that was ultimately because by the point people had reached traffic at Ogden, they had already sort of flown into an area that the idea was to divert them from in the first place. I think that traffic diverter should have started at Fairfax, not all the way into Ogden. And I'm supportive of bringing back a traffic diverter that, as we heard from the public, encourages local traffic, not pass-through traffic. Um, Willoughby is a neighborhood street and becoming a more robust cyclist network. And in order for that to work, it has to work. And I am happily in favor of inconveniencing site motorists, and I'll say that all day, if it promotes the safety of cyclists. And if we are not looking in the facts in the mirror about exactly how dangerous it is for people to choose this form of mobility, then I, I don't know how else to make this case. Um, the last thing I sort of wanna say is that on Kings and Santa Monica Boulevard, where the network begins on the west side traveling east, um, signage has sort of been a visual issue, at least for me, and I'm hoping we can address some of this in the wayfinding efforts that we're making. Um, I know I specifically talked to staff, but just to flag this uh, for everyone, the eastbound signage on Santa Monica at Kings uh, is where the indication of the bike lane ending begins. Um, and I believe that should be moved to the west side of the block for both like 
cyclist who will know that the lane is officially ended right then and there, and for the motorists who will know that they're gonna be all of a sudden dealing with a bike in their lane and sharing that lane. Um, I'm sure there's other notes I've confused in here, but I will yield to my colleagues. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Vice Mayor Byers. Council Member Shine. Um, I am uh, in full support of Council Member Byers on this item. Um, and she said everything that I was going to say, so I'm not going to take up any more time. Thank you so much, and I want to thank all the members of the public uh, that came out to speak tonight. Um, I just wanted to review a number of statistics that I think we all got that I actually asked for um, that I think we all face every day. For uh, These are the total number of accidents involving those that made were more than likely versus a car. Um, we are and did pass a Vision Zero plan in 2022. I believe that was your item with uh, then Council Member uh, Horvath. Um, and in 2018, we had eight, 28 accidents involving bikes, um, two with scooters. Spoiler alert, they were illegal in the city at that time, so only two, so they weren't really there until the pilot program, and 67 accidents involving pedestrians. Um, in 2023, that's five years uh, forward, we have 15 accidents with bikes, six with scooters, um, and 43 uh, pedestrians getting hit what from most likely uh, is a car. Um, I'm still trying to get that information, and thank you, Danny, and the Sheriff's Department for helping us suss that down. Um, when I worked at City Hall, uh, the quickest way to get to the uh, lot at, um, behind the Movie Town Plaza was to take Willoughby. Um, it was a well-known fact. I would frequently take the city Prius, sorry David, or Paul at that time, and you would shoot down Willoughby. Like, you would just go as fat because everything else was clogged up, right? And it's passed through traffic, right? So I see it every day, I walk it every day. When I actually went out with the WeHo Bike Coalition many years ago, um, we almost got killed on Willoughby, I think three times. Uh, a van chased us down, um, really angry by the way. I don't know where they were going, um, but I mean, and we had like sheriffs with us and everyone following us and you know, how do you handle it? That's one instance, right? So I think that this item itself is, uh, I think it speaks for itself. Um, and I think that when you look at the numbers of the returns for Healthy Streets LA, over two thirds of voters supported that in the city of LA for the city of LA to just follow their own mobility plan. And I feel like we're doing the patchwork thing here as well. Um, I disagree with the idea that you know we're only paying attention to one small subgroup. I do believe if you build it, they will come um, because it's safer for everyone. And I think bicyclists and bikers and every walkers and anyone that lives in that neighborhood, they talk to each other. And uh, people um, just even trying to cross the street with cars is dangerous. Um, and so all that we can do, I think, to what Vice Mayor Byer said, to make that area more safer and successful for the neighborhood is what I'm interested in. Remember, Fountain itself, and we're not talking about Fountain, there's a design plan com committee group, whatever's going on there. Bob, don't say that out loud too often because it's still a while away, um, but it's still coming. Fountain is a neighborhood street. It's classified as a neighborhood street and it is a freeway. And so when we look at Willoughby, it's much tighter and it is a freeway. People shoot down that street and it's, it's extremely dangerous for people, um, including motorists. This doesn't mean that we're not like in favor of people driving. I drive, I hate driving by the way. I, I hate it, I abhor it every day. I have to get a new tire almost every four months because of Fairfax, by the way, or one of these other streets that isn't maintained, and there goes my money. But I think that the way that we can make this better is, is really important. I am in, I agree with um, the greenbacks, uh, the bulb outs uh, at Fairfax. I think that the major drama regarding that item was said very accurately at the diverter. Um, was uh, regarding it, people turning on and then having to turn around and so stopping them before and keeping them on major corridors is something that I'm, I'm willing to see. And as someone who, this is my backyard, I mean, I walk up and down Vista to go to Astro Burger way too many times a day. Uh, they've got good hot dogs and hamburgers, but you know, um, it, it is, I see cars speed 
from Fountain all the way down to Santa Monica, and they barely stop at that stop sign. I mean, it is just completely not even in the periphery. And let me tell you, they don't live here. They don't live here, they don't care, and I honestly, when I see people parking on that street, I see cars that I haven't, I do not believe have moved, like, in forever. And so, while I would love to see more community outreach before this happens, and I think my colleagues would all agree that anyone or anything that we can do to tell people would be great, um, I, I still think that this is is the right thing to do for us to do it. And this is a parking zone, isn't it, Bob? Is it, what is the what parking district is um, uh, Vista between Hampton, Lexington, and Norton? It's all part of the same parking district, isn't it? I don't remember exactly which district, but I don't think there's permit parking on that street. Could we it, could we look at permit parking for those areas? Um, we have to talk to parking. Okay, yeah. that's a conversation for another day. Uh, and, and, and good segue. All right, um, so uh, I would, uh, if, what I, if it sounds like there's three votes for option 1A with the additional green back bulb out at Fairfax and uh, the um, and apologies the Fairfax all the way down to Willoughby bike lane option or what what did you say I wrote it I can't read my scribble fountain yes sorry Lexington? yes the whole, way. the whole way great do you agree to that would you would either of you like to make a motion I will motion that op we accept option 1A. Oh, God. Hold on. I lost it. We will add green backing to the Sharrows. Uh, an emphasis on automatic detection at the intersections with leading pedestrian intervals throughout the corridor. corridor. addressing the bulb out concerns in the traffic diverter and then my signage thing that I mentioned the Kings and Santa Monica Boulevard signage a very specific little issue Great. can you clarify what um, diverter issue Fairfax at Willoughby as a div as local traffic diver or a, a diverter only for local traffic to pass through it's in the letter that we got from the WeHo Bike Coalition. I believe they mentioned it on the second page, talking about the diverter. Um, is there a second before we go to discussion? Yes, yeah, so second. Oh, just go ahead, Bob. Just, just to, okay. Just we, to we clarify, so, so you're directing us to look at a diverter at Fairfax. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Second. Do we have qu comments? Yeah, well, I guess my first comment is around the diverter. That has not been studied, mm -hmm. and the motion before us is simply giving you direction to look at that. That is what I understood. Okay. Um, and then, uh, did you have something you wanted to add, Bob? Oh, no, no, I was just... The, the second thing is, I just want to clarify that this motion calls for the removal of 56% of the parking there without the residents really being notified of that. I mean, yes, they knew about this bike plan, and but they weren't necessarily informed that that street parking would necessarily be removed. It was something that was something that would was being considered, but we never notified the neighborhood about the removal of parking. No, not yet. Well, <laughs> well, I'm just thinking maybe we would like to do that right. before we approve that aspect of it. The other aspects of it I can go along with, but that aspect I'm not willing to support without the neighborhood actually knowing about it and, and having an opportunity to give input on that specific aspect of this plan. Does this item in itself uh, after approval tonight, would you need to come back to us for anything? We would have to come back for the diverter concept plan. Um, it's a very complicated um, strategy. Yes. Because 
once you block off uh, Willoughby at Fairfax, traffic will divert to Santa Monica, Romaine, and Warring. Well, so good we, luck getting through Romaine. Right. So my point is, we'll, we'll have to also mm -hmm. coordinate with the state of Los Angeles, and they may not agree with that. Well, approach. this is exploring so, right, this option. Right. It's not. It's not doing it. So I think what I'm hearing, and I understand you have a comment uh, or a question, Vice Mayor Byers, uh, is uh, from what my colleague said is that if we could give a uh, additional direction, that since the diverter traffic study issue has to come back in between that time and now to to send out a mailer or something to the residents to notify them of the Willoughby Streetscape program and all that it entails, um, so that way they're aware at least, and that uh, if you can plan it for when the item is coming back to council for them to approach us, then I, I think that then that's, that's feasible. That, that's how I would view it, but. Yeah, I mean, I would suggest that you just leave the 1A, option 1A, out of this particular motion and then you bring, as you said, you, you talk to residents, you let them know what is being considered and bring it back when they're bringing back the diverter item. And because the other side of this is if they don't have uh, restricted parking, they're gonna, ha they're gonna have to sign up for it. I mean, the process is that they have to go through the trouble of getting the restricted parking. So that's another aspect of this that, can't, that has to be considered. Okay. I was also gonna point out that no funding has been approved for this. So they're gonna to have to come back with um, specific requests for funding to implement any of this. So that would give us time to get additional input from the community about, and we're gonna to have to look at, do we implement all of this? The, high level cost estimates were $10 million. We may decide that when this comes back, we're not prepared to implement all of it. We're only gonna implement some of it based on cost considerations. Or City of LA may not be agreeable to all of it. Correct. Which is totally not our pocket. So. so what I see before us then, and maybe we can clarify the motion one more time, is that uh, the motion on the table is to approve item 1A and then we could approve it as is, and then we could do separate direction for the other two items to come back as a separate motion? Or what? what was her motion? In other words, option 1A, that you don't approve that, that, that you, you approve B. the other parts of oh. it, and you leave the street the way it is for now, so you, you don't necessarily approve 1B either, you just say for now, leave it, go back to the community to get input, on that particular aspect of this of this program. I'll leave it to the makers of the motion. I say we go forward with 1A. It sounds like there's an opportunity that everything's going to come back for this council, and so between that, we can notice about the parking concerns that some have, seem to have. Um, my understanding is that this has gone through robust community discussion and an assumption that bike lanes are going to be in place of parking would be fair to make, but I understand that we wanna clarify that with community so we can do that. So 1A, if we wanna take the traffic diverter at Fairfax Willoughby as a separate piece, because it needs to be that way, I will willingly do that, but everything else should be a part of the other 1A motion. Great, let's, make, let's take a vote on that. So we're gonna take the diverter at Fairfax and Willoughby as a separate motion, but the motion before us then is a to approve item uh, 1A. A motion by Count Vice Mayor Byers and a second by Council Member Shine. Can you do a roll call vote? Yes. Council Member Hyland. No. Council Member Meister. No. Council Member Shine. Yes. Vice Mayor Byers. Yes. yes. And Mayor Erickson. Yes. Can I ask before we move on to anything, if if we come back and we do get community feedback about the removal of parking? is there an opportunity for us as a council to change our mind? I, I think according to the direction right now, no. I think, wait, I think, well, you can always change your position at the time that we come back with funding and, you know, yeah. giving you a, any more, you know, I, I think you answered that. the question. All right, but, you answered it. But the, yeah, it's, it sounds like that's the direction we're moving forward sounds with option good. 1A. We're gonna provide 
feedback Thank to the you. community, and we'll bring that back. And then I'll make a motion to study the item um, at, of a diverter at uh, Fairfax and Willoughby, um, and to come back with the council, hopefully succinctly with uh, what, however you can line up this item to be together. Is there a second? I don't think so. Well, it's just direction then? Well, you, you, well, you, you voted no anyway, so it doesn't make a difference. Okay, well then, as long as you take that as direction to come back with a motion that, I mean, as a part of the original motion, then we're fine. Sound good? We're good? Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We're going to move on. We are moving on to the two more items tonight. Oh, no, actually, we have three. Um, thank you so much. We're going to uh, go to the, I think it's the appointment, and now I'm all screwed up, of the social appointments to the Older Adults Advisory Board and the Social Justice Advisory Board. Uh, City Clerk, I believe you're going to handle this item. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, so we are requesting that uh, Council Member Shine uh, appoint her appointee to the Social Justice Advisory Board. Do you have an appointee? I do. I am very uh, excited to appoint Justin Powell to the Social Justice Advisory Board. Congratulations. Yay. Wonderful. Congratulations, Justin. And then um, in regards to the at-large appointments for the older adults one. I had mentioned this at our last meeting, but I believe we have, uh, oh, sorry, I'm pulling up the wrong item. An at-large? That's correct. Great, so I would like to nominate Dean Shimaninsky uh, for the, I hope I said that right, for the uh, uh, position. Thank you, would you like a roll call vote? Are we all in agreement? Okay, well approved by consensus, perfect. Now, Great. for the social justice at large, are yep. we ready to make an appointment? No. I, I'm not ready. The person I was going to nominate for at large was just appointed, so. You want to make, I'm happy to. Can I would we? like to nominate Stephen Post. I would request that we table this item. Okay, yeah. we'll come back. Um, I would recommend, though, that at the next meeting we make this decision, so make sure whoever is ready to be going, we should, we should have full advisory can we, boards. Uh, and can we do um, some type of um, outreach again to get more applicants that um, uh, are, um, uh, that can be part of the um, Social Justice Advisory Board that are BIPOC, please? Will do. Thank you. Thank you so much. All good ideas. Um, wonderful. We're going to move on to new business. Item 6B is the only one. Um, direction to amend the conditional use permits of hotels and residential zoning districts to allow on-site restaurants to serve non-guests. And I believe um, this was uh, Councilmember Heilman. And if you wanted to give any type of background, and I know one of my colleagues had questions. Yes, and I believe we also have a public speaker yes. who's been waiting uh, patiently for this item. Um, what we discovered during COVID is that, or, or one of the things that the city did during COVID was to allow residential hotels, hotels that are operating in residential zones, to serve um, non-hotel guests at their restaurants. This was... Um, you know, this was a nice opportunity for the hotels to get additional business, but it was also designed to allow neighbors in the community to get takeout food. When these residential hotels were approved, um, one of the conditions that the council put on them was that their restaurants could only serve hotel guests and their guests, but they could not serve members of the general public. Um, we allowed that to occur during COVID, and we discovered that there really weren't any complaints. There were no uh, adverse impacts to the neighborhood. Um, they, the hotels weren't overrun with business from uh, neighborhood residents. So this would just essentially extend what we were doing during COVID and make it a permanent change for those hotels. We effectively eliminate that restriction that they're not allowed to serve uh, residents other than hotel guests. Um, I know that there have been some concerns about activities on the rooftop, 
but this is not addressing that. That's a separate issue. So that, that's what this is uh, designed to do, to have our staff initiate a change to the CUPs to allow them to serve uh, non-hotel guests. Thank you. Um, Councilor Mershine, do you have questions for Councilor Hyman, or would you like to just go to the public commenter first? I'd like to go to the public commenter. All right. I, I think Council Member Meister had a question. Oh, you have a question, yeah, yes. I, don't know. I, I'm, I just wanted to confirm with the city attorney that this has to go through a process where it goes to planning commission for zone text amendment or whatever it is that they have to do. Yes, this would not be yeah. done over the counter. It would have to okay. go through the planning process. Okay, thank you. And I'm sure our public commenter is wishing he spoke on first consent now, but please come on up. <laughs> Thank you for waiting so diligently. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> I'll uh, introduce myself. Good evening, uh, Honorable Mayor Erickson and council members, and uh, apologies to the council and city clerk for my mistake earlier this meeting. My name is James Brine. I'm a researcher with Unite Here Local 11. We oppose this item. The proposed expansion of use was not contemplated when these hotels were first approved. Uh, there is already an existing process by which hotels can seek the expansion of use. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Councilmember Shine. Yes, I, um, just to understand, uh, so it, will this mean that um, all of these hotels will automatically be covered, or is there another process that they would individually need to go to planning commission for? Is it one swoop of all the hotels? It's intended to be one swoop rather than having each individual hotel apply for this change. This condition was put in not by the county when these were built as hotels. This was put in when the city inherited these buildings that were approved as residential hotels. So they could be used either as residences or hotels. They had been used as residences, but then they converted to hotels. So in the early days of cityhood, we were left with that mess. Um, and we tried to uh, limit um, the activities of the hotel, primarily to protect the neighborhood. What we saw during COVID, however, is that this particular limitation really wasn't protecting the neighborhood. There was no adverse impact from lifting this particular restriction. I guess um, my, uh, when did this, is this, when did this reverse this restriction? When the emergency powers ended? Or not, when did, we opened it up during COVID but when did that stop? Oh, I don't know an exact date, but all of the emergency orders and special permissions time. during COVID have, have been ended for at least a year, but I, I don't have an exact date on Okay, me. so my concern is, um, and I understand your, the reasoning, but during COVID, there weren't a ton of people out everywhere. So my concern is that if we do this, um, under the circumstances that now exist, which is more people out, then the neighborhood might not, we don't know how this is tested as we are out of the pandemic now. Um, so I would either not be in support of this and we just keep what we have, which is the hotels can go ahead and request, right? Uh, to change the, what is the, what is the, um, uh, way in which the hotels can change this. Is it an outright ban? There's no way for them to do this one by one? So that's a good, I'm actually having trouble pulling up the zoning code. It looks like it changed today. Okay. But, um, <laughs> I, I believe it's by CUP. They, they each have, they their each have a condition. Okay. And the condition would need to be changed because they're limited individually. And how much does that cost the hotels? How much does it cost? Yeah, what's the process? Is there a cost process? That's the Nick question, sorry. <laughs> and, and while you're looking it up, Nick. I can look it up. <laughs> uh, I, when, uh, before Council Member Heilman and Vice Mayor Byers were on the council, 
Um, I was Council Member Horvath who actually put forth an item to make, after the end of the emergency powers, to make this permanent. Mm -hmm. And we actually, I think, unanimously all agreed on it. Um, and I'm wondering what that timeline is. I'm happy my colleague put this forward, but I was under the assumption this was already coming back to us. So mm -hmm. I was, when I saw it on the, on the agenda from a colleague, great, good, grand, um, I specifically remember sitting over there when we were talking about the ways in which we could help restaurants and hotels and making them available to have guests from the outside that weren't guests was talked about. And I'm almost positive it was Council Member Horvath at that time. I'm not sure if it was an item, but it was definitely a, a discussion. Right? It was a discussion that was had that to try to uh, so. keep some of those things in place. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to yeah. say that this isn't a new conversation. Yeah, it's not, it's not a new thing. Got it. But um, what, what I would like to say is I think I'm, I'm comfortable with this as long as there is a public process through Planning Commission. And what I would suggest to staff is to make sure that um, where the residential hotels are, that there be the noticing on a 500-foot radius of, the, of all of our residential hotels. So that way we just ensure that the public is aware uh, that of the people who are most impacted uh, are getting notices for it and not expected to be see it in the Beverly Press or something. Yeah, um, that would be my only suggestion. Yeah. I think that's fine. I think that would be probably necessary, and this would be a citywide amendment, so it would likely require that kind of noticing. With respect to uh, Council Member Shine's concerns, I want to point out that most of these. Um, have restaurants uh, that are very small. So La Park probably has one of the largest ones. I think there may be, you know, 10, 12 tables there. Um, the uh, Chamberlain has a very small uh, restaurant inside of the hotel, again, primarily to serve uh, the guests there. So we're not talking about facilities that could accommodate a large number of people uh, other than the hotel guests. Great. Do you have an answer for Council Member Shine? Potentially. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just maybe just wanted to clarify a little bit because I think there are a couple of items that are maybe getting mixed up and bundled up as one item yeah. and I think might be a couple of separate items. Okay. Um, so regarding hotels allowing non guests to use um, the hotel amenities and residential zones. So staff did report back to council on this particular item back in August of 2022. And at that time, that's when um, uh, staff mentioned that it's available right now to hotel operators in residential zones to just come and amend their CUP, or if they're legally non-conforming to get a CUP, and we can amend you know, the, the permits to allow for uh, non-guests to use the hotel amenities. Um, so we contacted the hotel operators, didn't want to do that. Um, so this particular item will, is exploring other avenues, right? That we would wholesale um, do permit that um, instead of individual hotel operators coming to um, coming to uh, amend their CUPs. Um, the other related but separate item um, was the idea of um, looking at amending the zoning code to allow additional height for hotels to expand some of their rooftop activities. So, um, and that has nothing, nothing to, do to do with, with the with item design. tonight. Exactly. Yeah. But I think and that, I already that, said that. The, yeah, that is the other item that I think kind of gets combined with, with this discussion. But that item is coming forth to the Planning Commission probably in May, should get to the Thank City you. Council sometime in June, July. So I just wanted to Wonderful. level set that. Do that does not answer my question. The CU. Yeah, the CUP. Yeah, the press. Yeah. <laughs> Nick has. I, I'm prepared to move the recommendation. Oh. Okay. I have an answer for your question about um, the CUP process. So um, a major conditional use permit where the commission approval is required is uh, $9,258. I believe the amendment process um, is half of that fee. So one half of that fee to amend it um, based on the fee schedule for 23-24. Okay. So essentially we wouldn't be getting that it would just be a ZTA, and how many hotels are there? I don't think we've, I think that the, um, the action would uh, direct staff and city attorney to work together to 
determine and, and bring forward the appropriate action. I don't think we've determined whether that action would be a zone text amendment, whether it would be- just direction. Yeah, whether yes, it would be um, a grouping together of conditional use permit amendments. I think we'd have to explore uh, what the appropriate mechanism would so be. So we may still get some money back to the city. So In terms of, of fees? Yes. Uh, with this action, I think you, I, I, I would um, defer to the city attorney with respect to that. I, I'm, I'm not sure how we, I've, and maybe we would have to determine that I don't that think there's a, necessarily a fee waiver associated with this, if that's your question. Yeah. I think it's to figure out the best, most streamlined process to accomplish this goal. Yes. This the goal given. was for it to be city initiated so yeah. that the hotels didn't oh, have to okay. pay, each hotel didn't have to pay a fee. When we come forward with a zone text mm. amendment, we don't pay a fee and people who are benefited from it don't pay a fee for that when we initiate it. Would you like to make a motion, Councilmember Hammond? Yes, I would still like to make a motion to <laughs> approve the item. Thank you. I'll Thank second. You. Sounds good, there is a motion and a second. Um, let's go forth and do a voice vote. Councilmember Heilman? Aye. Councilmember Meister? Aye. Councilmember Schein? No. Vice Mayor Byers? Yes. And Mayor Erickson? Yes. All right, we're gonna now move on to excluded consent. And that was, uh, I believe, uh, Council Member Meister for the resiliency item. You just had questions. You don't need yeah, a report. Yeah, I need to do a report. I just, Great. I have some questions and some comments, and I don't know if there are speakers on this, in case I get mixed up and start commenting while I'm questioning. But um, it seems to me that there are some items at the end of this report that. Um, that are actually looking for direction from us. So I was kind of confused as to why this is on consent instead of coming to us asking for direction. Um, specifically, the identified gaps, needs, and resources. Um, you have develop and implement heat action plans that include early warning systems. The city doesn't have a dedicated document, blah, blah, blah. You need to get additional um, that one has the Board of Supervisors doing that, I'm so I picked the wrong thing. But on the next page, uh, identifying additional opportunities for municipal solar and storage project, and to, it says if the, if the city council is, you know, wants to do this, we can start looking at, at cost estimates. And then the same thing for um, that, well, microgrid and, and uh, accessible and operational in times of emergency city facilities. So it seems to me that you're looking for some feedback from us whether to move forward with for looking at, at those items, at least to get bids uh, or to get some kind of estimates on it. That's, I mean, that's how I read it. Um, so that's why I wanted to be able to give you that direction and hope that my colleagues would be amenable to that. Um, then the other thing I wanted to bring up is uh, on the, on, on the um, items that you have having to do with uh, resilient people and neighborhoods, I think what's missing there is universal design of affordable units. Uh, we had an item that was approved by the council, that was adopted by council uh, to help uh, people and affordable units to be able to age in place was to require universal, um, universal design. And I don't think that that has been implemented yet, and I see that as being part of our whole resilience effort, at least under resilient people and neighborhoods, as you have it separated. So I, I wanted to make sure that that wasn't, um, you know, didn't fall through the cracks. Um, and then I just wanted to comment on um, regarding the West Hollywood cap and climate vulnerability assessment. You have Figure 10, which is a map. Uh, depicting high groundwater contours and is prone to liquefaction, which was last meeting's word, I believe, was liquefaction. Um, I just want staff to take a good look at that Norma Triangle area and don't be surprised when a project that's digging down 20 to 30 feet hits water because it's in your own map. Um, so anyway, I'm all in for staff to start getting estimates for municipal solar and storage projects, ensuring critical city facilities are accessible and operational in terms of emergency and microgrid projects that expand neighborhood resilience. Um, 
and it looked to me like you were looking for that direction. So I would like to motion that council gives that direction for staff to start investigating and getting uh, getting um, uh, project uh, cost estimates. I will second that. Do my colleagues have any comments on that? Nope. Do you? And there are no public comments, right? No public no comments. Commenters. Great. Let's do a quick roll call vote. Councilmember Heilman. Aye. Councilmember Meister. Aye. Councilmember Shine. Vice Mayor Byers. Yes. And Mayor Erickson. Aye. Thank you so much. We are now going to move on to the last public comment period. This time it's been a set aside to address the public comment on any item of interest within the subject matter jurisdiction that cannot be heard under item one at the beginning of the meeting. Do we have public commenters? I'm guessing it's Rick Watts. I knew it. Come on down, Rick. In that beautiful blue suit. Thank you, Council. Rick Watts, City of West Hollywood. Um, just a question which you may or may not be, be able to address here, but I, it's a question that I have nonetheless. Um, I remember some, well, many mon months ago, uh, council um, acted to void, I, I think void is the appropriate word, uh, side agreements in, uh, in apartment, uh, apartment settings where, where a landlord was charging extra for a, a service. And I just would like guidance in terms of exactly how that was handled. I, I, I wasn't here when the item was actually acted on. I, I found out, I, I just remember it being uh, that uh, Council Member Shine uh, mentioning that this had been done. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm, my housemate and I uh, are in such a situation where our uh, landlord for many years has ch had charged us for the second parking space. Mm -hmm. That action was passed and, and we were of the impression, uh, correctly or otherwise, that we don't have to pay that anymore. But, I'm, but the landlord is trying to say, no, 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 <laughs> you got to. And I went down to City Hall the other day and was told, that, well, what's probably going to happen is you, you, you need to uh, file an appeal and what we will end up doing is folding that the the what you had been paying into a new uh rent figure that takes that seventy five dollars into consideration and I just want guidance is is that actually what what the in, the intent and and effect of whatever that action was that you all did some months ago we can't talk to you because it's public comment but I'm sure yep. uh, one of our amazing city staff will help Great. you out sounds good Thank you so much, Rick. Thank we'll you. We'll have someone contact you. Thank you. you. I figured you would, David. <laughs> we'll have someone contact you from rent stabilization tomorrow. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you. Any more public commenters? Wonderful. We're going to go on to council member attendance reports and comments. Council member Meister, would you mind starting? I'm sorry, sure. I just looked to my no, right. That's okay. Um, so, all right, so let me find my comments. Okay, I'm going to start with um, consent calendar, and, and I just want to say a few words about 2I, the dockless micro-mobility item, um, which, of course, I was glad that, uh, that it was brought forward. Um, but I just wanted to make note that under fiscal impact, the program is expected to generate new city revenues of 25000 to 50000 in program fees and zero to 15,000 in penalty fees, and the program is costing us $40,000 for data management software and $38,000 for ABM for three months. So the best case scenario financially is that the city is losing $13,000, uh, and the worst case scenario that we know of is the city losing $53,000 on this program, and that doesn't even include staff time. So I've said it before and I'm gonna say it again, why are we putting money into a program where the contractor is making money and we are losing money? And so I am very sorry that um, we are allowing this to happen. Uh, regarding 2J, the design update for log cabin renovation program, program, project, my only comment is that I'd like to see those pine trees back in the renderings. It's part of the historic nature of this property and it would be a tremendous loss if it were to be eliminated. So I hope staff will find a way to save them. Um, let's see, we discussed 6B. 
Uh, attendance since our last meeting, I attended the West Hollywood Chamber's annual member meeting and board installation, attended the Public Safety Appreciation Luncheon and Awards, represented uh, Regional Council District 41 at the SCAG Joint Meeting of the Policy Committees and the Regional Council Meeting, uh, swore in Planning Commissioner Lynn Hoopengarner, attended uh, Women's Advisory Board's National Women's History Month party, and uh, got to chat with uh, with Wendy Birch of KTLA during their LA Marathon coverage. And then in terms of announcements, I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that the City of West Hollywood's Human Rights Speaker Series presents a film screening and conversation on Tuesday, March 19th from 6.30 to 9.30 for Freedom on Fire, Ukraine's Fight for Freedom. And on Wednesday, March 20th from 5.45 to 6.45, there will be a neighborhood meeting for a proposed project at 840 to 852 Hilldale Avenue, 837, 849 San Vicente Boulevard, and 850 San Vicente Boulevard. The meeting will be held at the Ramada Plaza Conference Room. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Shine. Um, I, uh, for attendance, uh, all I have is attendance. I went to South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. Uh, Texas, not my favorite place at all. Uh, however, South by Southwest was wonderful um, to attend and um, saw some uh, great panels there. So that's it. Thank you so much, Councilmember Heilman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Thank you, Mayor. I also attended the Public Safety Awards, the opening of the King Ray Studio. I uh, swore in uh, my new appointee to the LGBT plus uh, advisory board. I also attended the Women's Advisory Board History event. Uh, I went to uh, West Hollywood Elementary School fundraiser, went to the chamber event, also attended the Elton John party. I want to thank all of our staff, our public safety, firefighters, special events, and facilities for their uh, work yesterday um, with the marathon running through West Hollywood. I want to also congratulate all of the people who ran the marathon um, and the half marathon charity event. Uh, I ran that yesterday. That's why I'm tired tonight and I'm looking forward to the end of the meeting. Thank you, Mayor. We're almost there, Vice Mayor Byers. Thank you. I was happy to uh, attend the Bulgarian Liberation Day event with the General Consulate where we declared uh, I believe it was March 3rd, Bulgarian American Friendship Day here in the city of West Hollywood. Um, I attended the Clean Power Alliance Board of Directors meeting, the National League of Cities Federal Transportation and Infrastructure Services Advocacy Committee where I serve um, and had an opportunity to meet with Senator Alex Padilla, Senator LaFonza Butler, and our Congressman Adam Schiff um, in DC where we were uh, lobbying for some direct funds here for the city. Hopefully good news to come. Um, I also had an opportunity then to meet with the chairman of the Health Transportation Infrastructure Committee, Sam Graves. We know that rail is uh, and continues to be one of the most important conversations nationwide, and as it's happening in our own back door, it was really exciting to be a part of that conversation. Um, I attended the Civic Well Policymakers Conference the next day. It's been a long week. Um, and this morning, was happy to join Supervisor Lindsay Horvath at her table for the Los Angeles County Commission on Women and Girls Women of the Year event. Um, I just want to share one comment uh, because I did receive comments from the community over uh, concerns over our progress towards our housing element and totally understand that we, uh, you know, there are reasons to be concerned. We are behind in uh, our goals, but I see efforts tonight and uh, from this council to keep us on track. We are laser focused on ensuring housing is available and appreciate uh, our community's continued focus towards that end as well. Thank you, Mayor, for a very well-run meeting. Appreciate you. <laughs> We're almost done. Um, attendance, I attended the reopening of the Trendsetters Barbershop. Uh, I made the WeHo Pride announcement, more on that. Uh, the Contract Cities Ledge Committee meeting, the Hollywood Now Herstory Awards honoring Abby Land. I attended the J uh, Elton John party and was envious of my colleague's outfit. That's Councilmember Heilman. Um, he looked fabulous. Um, and I also attended the Jewish Federation of LA's second annual LA Leaders reception. Um, and 
addition to a few comments, uh, welcome back Jones and trendsetters. Um, I want to thank city staff who helped diligently to get them open and back open. That's the joy of working in the city of West Hollywood. And they were very, very uh, well, um, they're very, very happy. And I want to say that uh, trendsetters is one of our very few only black owned businesses in the city of West Hollywood. And the amount of gratitude and joy seeing them reopen um, was amazing. And I have to get my hair cut there now. Um, congratulations on all the runners. I was sad to miss it. I was away for our conference. Um, additionally, a public safety awards luncheon. Thanks to all my colleagues that attended. I got called to DC for work, so sadly I had to miss it. On the consent calendar regarding the log cabin, um, I too um, am very happy that this is moving forward, and I look forward to, I think, the city continuing to work with uh, the community there to identify ways in which it's financially feasible. Um, and then if you haven't heard, uh, but We Hope Pride is coming, um, and it is going to be bigger and better than uh, ever before, I think. Um, and it's really exciting. Um, Out Loud is putting together probably what is going to be a, a knockout show. They have headliner Kylie Minogue, uh, who I had to tell David who she was, but that's okay. I'm outing you, so now's the time to figure that out. Um, but I also, uh, uh, Janelle Monet, who is no stranger to WeHo Pride, when Mayor Shine was there giving her an Icon Award, and then Diplo and Friends. And I've been told the and Friends part is gonna be quite amazing, plus an incredible lineup. And tickets are pretty much, <laughs> they're, they're almost gone, so get them now. Um, but the Friday night lineup, more to come on that, is going to also be amazing. That was an item that when we created We Hope Pride, the free Friday night lineup is going to um, knock the boots down, house hunty, or whatever they say, whatever the Gen Zers say. Um, but I'm really thankful to JJLA and our incredible special events and communications team who are going to make We Hope Pride even better this year. And uh, we're going to do a lot of special stuff stuff um, on the boulevard. And with that, it is uh, 1121, and this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>